Material quick lime, which is of course the cheapest form of lime, the most economic form of lime to, to buy historically and still today, um, which was the basis of most mortars for most of history, along with clay and lime together. Um, and that was still very well understood and still being done in parts of the UK, certainly in much of the world, in the 1950s, and then somehow got forgotten, and it, it's a weird thing, hot mixing disappeared, it seemed, everywhere I've been in the world. About 1955, it's like some kind of iron curtain drops. And, and then, only 20 years later, we needed a lime revival. That's a strange thing to me, that because clearly there was still lots of craft people around in the world and in this country who, who used quicklime routinely. In my area in North Yorkshire, around Moulton, Pickering, the lime kilns were still working in the 1980s and the builders made their cement lime mortars with quicklime. You have to talk to these people to understand, to find these things out, because they're not going to tell you. But So, weirdly, they were hot mixing cement lime mortars, which actually is not such a bad thing. And, and you might be shocked to hear me say that, but I will be developing this theme. Um, there's no question in my mind that we would be better off at building new houses using a cement lime mortar than we would using a natural hydraulic lime water. Shock horror, but the evidence would suggest that if we, when we talk through what we're talking about today, which is everything in a water, all the properties, all the properties that a water needs to have in terms of the way it bonds to the fabric of a building, or to the stones of a building, the efficiency of that bond, the full extent of that bond, and the durability of that bond. And when I say durability, I certainly don't mean that when you make a cube of that more and take it to a laboratory and saturate it and then throw it straight away into an instant freezer and it's getting frozen from six sides as a cube. Uh, and, and seeing how long it takes for that to fall apart, keep doing that over and over and over again until it all falls to pieces, and then say, oh, well, that's a durable, or that's not a durable mortar. That's not the durability we're concerned about in traditional building, except in certain areas, like on the tops of chimneys, where it's going to get soaking wet all the time and then maybe freeze. The durability that matters is the durability of the bond the fact that that bond between the stone and the brick and the mortar is well made in the first place, that it's a full extent of bond between the, the units, and that it stays bonded indefinitely. That's the durability we're talking about. And that durability comes from airline. That durability of bond, that formation of a good bond, <coughs> comes from airline and the more airline you can have the better ideally and optimally you just have airline no other ingredients nothing to make it in any way hydraulic that's the water that will give you the best bond and the most durable bond of all for a long long time so that's one aspect the other aspect is that it, it needs to be a workable material, a material that when you give it to someone to use, they can use it efficiently, that it, when you put it somewhere, it stays there. It doesn't fall off or slide down the wall or fall off your trowel before you manage to get it onto the wall or into the building. 
anyone who works with NHL routinely knows that but at the end of the day, there's as much on the ground as there is in the wall. That's not a workable mortar. So you're giving people, and nor is cement and sand a workable mortar. It doesn't stick to things. It's got no inherent cohesiveness. It's got no real adhesiveness to speak of. It's got some, because there is some lime in, in a, a natural hydraulic lime, some air lime, but not actually a lot. So it needs to be workable because workability, which I think we've come to think as being something nice if you can have it, or we don't even know what it is. I mean, that's <laughs> because we've been using unworkable, non-workable mortars for so long, we've forgotten what workability actually is. Um, and so we, we do weird things to try and make those mortars workable. As an example, we use with NHL, or a lot of people do, I say we, I don't, but we, we use, for instance, soft yellow building sand, which is all rounded, all one size. It's shit. It's, it's rubbish, sorry. I've got to remember I've been filmed because I swear a lot. But, um, uh, and, and that was identified as being an utterly inappropriate sand for making mortars with as long as go as 1780 by a guy called Brian Higgins, who did a lot of analysis in London, an Irishman in London at that time. Uh, and, and it's still, but it's the British standard sand, for goodness sake. So I'm trying to, sorry. I, so we've got to be, you know, one cement to five sand. That's the standard building water today. It's not workable and it doesn't form a durable bond. It doesn't form a proper bond. The United, Bureau, the United States Bureau of Standards back in the 1920s and 30s looked intensively at mortars for reasons I'll talk about later. But the one mortar that they said was the worst possible mortar that you could build with, build a building with, from every angle, from the angle of workability, from bond, from its, its tendency to let water straight through the wall because it doesn't form a proper bond, the tendency to expand and contract whenever it gets wet, therefore breaks whatever bond it made. We all know this, cement comes loose on an old building, but because it expands and contracts every time it gets wet. A little bit, but a little bit is enough. Water only needs a, a, a passageway one thousandth of a millimeter to go through. If you've got that between your mortar and your brick, your brick is your building is a wet building. Uh, uh, so they concluded that the worst possible mix, as I say, was one cement to five sand. That's what all our new houses are being built with. Hence we have to have cavity trays in our new houses now, so that the water that passes through the mortar joint, runs down the inside of the wall, can come out again. This is ridiculous. I mean, but what it illustrates is that in this country, the building trades, the building industry, the specifying industry has no real understanding of mortars and what they're actually for. So you'll hear people say a mortar is there to keep the stones apart. That kind of implies it's, it, it doesn't matter if it's stuck to them or not, because it's there as a spacer. That's not a historical understanding of what mortars are for. Mortars are there to hold, stick the bits together and keep them stuck together. They're not there just to keep them apart. The other function that we need mortars to perform is that when they receive water, which actually in a capillary active material that we're talking about, won't go very far in from the outside when it's hit by rain, maybe uh, that far, generally speaking, even in intense heavy rain. What we need is for that water then to come out as soon as it's right. Robin Pender at Historic England even suggests or argues that even when it's raining, if you've got the right mortar there that is capillary active, the building will be drying as it's wetting. You know, it's not it's not just waiting till it stops raining, it's that wherever there isn't rain hitting the mortar is coming out of that mortar. And then of course we've got the moisture that comes up from the ground, the moisture that's generated inside the building. We all generate, I think, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's about nine litres of water a day a human being is going to exude into the atmosphere 
Plus we've got washing machines, we've got baths, we've got showers, we've got all these things that are producing moisture inside a building. And so the, the materials that are inside the building need to let that water in and let it out again and if need be for, for that water to be able to pass through the wall and out. And a fundamental point I want to make here is vapour permeability doesn't do that. Believe this, you need capillarity, not vapour permeability. Most of the products you'll see out, and this is very important to you homeowners, most of the products that you see out there that claim to be breathable are vapour permeable but not very capillary active. They're not breathable. It's a lie. At worst, it's a lie. At best, it's an error. So most of the materials out there, if they are breathable but only vapour permeable, they will not dry your building out. They will cause it to get wetter and wetter. So bear that in mind. We need capillary activity. We need the mortars, when water is in them, to come out very fast and very efficiently, which it does if you use a high capillary active mortar. And the material that gives you a high capillary active mortar, there are two materials. One of them is earth lime, so clay and lime in combination. And the other is a lime, air lime rich mortar. So that can be dry hydrated lime, which again, in throughout the lime revival, we've condemned as being rubbish. That's not true. It has far more historic precedence as a binder than does lime putty, which is what we built the lime revival on. Uh, it's produced very efficiently down the, in the lime works here, but we've condemned that as rubbish. Oh, it's just what builders use for plasticizing cement mortars. No, it can be used on its own, but it needs to be mixed to the right proportion and it needs to be dealt with in a different way. Or you can use lime putty. They didn't tend to use lime putty historically, shock horror. Uh, as a binder, so they distrusted it as a binder, they used it on its own for very particular purposes, for fine finish coats, for the fine joints you get in really you know, red rubbing brick, tight really one millimeter, two millimeter joints, and for bedding ashlar stone, you know, really with very fine joints, two, three mil. They would use lime putty for that, and they would use it on its own. And what they certainly would not do, and I'm going to say this here, is what the Scottish Lime Centre and others say you should do, is to put linseed oil in that lime putty. No. That will make it non-breathable. That will make it waterproof. Why do we want a waterproof mortar? We don't. We want a capillary active mortar. So don't listen to anyone who tells you to put linseed oil in lime wash. You can do it once. You'll never get another coat of lime wash on it. It'll never stick on it. And it will trap moisture behind itself. So be very, very careful about what you buy. Be very, very careful about the advice that you get from lime suppliers. We have the right to believe that they're, they're a bonus. They're a great thing. Some of them are. Some of the materials they sell are, but their advice is not always accurate. And they're, so I won't go say any more than that. Be very skeptical, be very critical in your thinking when people say, oh, use this. That's breathable. Right, it's breathable. Is it breathable? Is it capillary active? So ASIA, the main lime supplier, a main NHL supplier, one of the main ones, and suppliers are probably probably the best quality of the NHLs if you want to use them, used to have emblazoned across their adverts until really very recently, low free lime, low capillarity, like that was a good thing. High vapour permeability, but that doesn't work, low capillarity. Suddenly, I noticed in Spab magazine a few years ago, in the light of every all the stuff that's going on and all the talk and discussion that's going on and particularly in the light of David Wiggins's research, uh, a Scot based down in Kendall, um, suddenly across their advert, it's, it's been photoshopped in high capillarity. And I'm thinking, oh, 
What's changed in this year? Has the material changed? Have you redesigned your mortar? Which you can't because it's supposed to be natural. What's going on? What's going on is marketing. Okay, and that's what you've got to be aware of in all of these materials. So, the materials we're talking about are really basic. They're really cheap, generally speaking. A lot of the ingredients that we might add in to make them hydraulic are recycled materials. Brick, roof tiles, crushed up, this sort of thing. So they're recycled, they're sustainable, they're locally accessible. Wood ashes possibly the most common thing that might be added to, it doesn't improve the mortars, but to change them a bit, to make them a bit less, a uh, bit more hydraulic, but minimally. Um, so we built the Lime Revival as a site, but no, let me finish that. So that breathability, that capillarity comes from high free lime, high air lime content. That's the only place it really comes from, except when it's in combination with clay. So we need to have in any mortar we use the highest proportion of air lime that we can get appropriate to the place it is in the building. That's the critical thing. The question is how do we achieve that hydrolicity when we want it? We'd, we can achieve it with quick lime, hot mixing or mixing other forms of slate air lime with pozzolanic materials, materials that will react with, the, with that in a, to create a hydraulic component in that mix. And then we've got levels, we've got different levels we might add in. Um, but as I say, the, the, <clears throat> the capillarity, the, the true breathability, uh, comes from the airline. Airline calcium carbonate has a very, creates a mortar that is very dense in a good way, very dense in one micron pores or pores just either side of one micron. That's tiny, that's not imaginable, that's a thousandth of a millimeter. <laughs> but those, that pore size is the optimal pore size for capillary movement. Water doesn't want to stay in a pore that small, it wants to get out of it. The other key thing that's delivered is, is a high density of those size pores and they are all interconnected. They're all joined together. So that there's a continuum out. David characterizes it as a conveyor belt. What's driving that movement is air movement. And the wicking away of water molecules from the face of the mortar, they're then immediately replaced by water molecules from behind. It's a conveyor belt. As, so, and that is a very efficient mechanism for moving moisture out of the fabric or out of any porous material. It's the essential thing and it comes again from a high air lime content. So we reduce that lime content at our peril and we see the consequences when we do. I will touch just very briefly on cement lime mortars were a compromise when they were originated in the early 20th century. You might put one cement, three lime, three air lime, 12 sand, that was a, a basic mix. You might put one cement, two lime, nine sand, or you might do 116. 116 was a mortar that, until John Asher said otherwise, was reserved largely for the tops of chimneys and really exposed situations. Uh, before we embraced NHL, it had come to be seen, it still is in America, as a, somehow a conservation mix. It really is not. <laughs> but 129 actually delivers a mortar on test that, that is less strong than most NHLs on the market, has 66% air lime in it. Most NHLs have much less than that. Uh, so where, what are we looking at? We're, when we look at NHLs, we're actually looking at a natural cement lime mortar. That's what we're looking at. We've got cement in, the, in there and we've got some air lime. But that's an unpredictable material. Cement lime mortars are entirely predictable. And predictability is one of the key principles of building. <laughs> so you know what you're using and you know what it's going to do and you know how hard it will be. 
That's something we do not know with NHLs. We, no one can tell us. We know that they continue to gain strength for at least three years. We think it's quite likely that they continue to gain strength indefinitely, forever. Every gain in strength is a reduction in porosity, typically, because the, the, the compressive strength gain comes from the densification of the mortar. If you've got lots of air in there, as you have in an airline mortar, it's not got great compressive strength because there's air. So, <clears throat> in pores. So, <clears throat> I'll, we'll talk more about NHLs, but they're a very unreliable material in the sense that they are entirely unpredictable. They vary between the brands in strength. Uh, they vary within the same brand in strength because they are a natural product. You know, the, the strength comes from the balance of clay, reactive clay, and lime in the limestone that they burn. But that varies all of the time. So historically, they didn't. I've said they didn't use lime putty as a binder. It's not a damaging binder. Don't get me wrong. It's not going to do any damage. But they didn't much use it. They certainly didn't use NHL very much at all. They didn't use it for building. This is quite a shocking thing because everything you read assumes that that's what they did use. We've been we've had a, we've had 45 years of, of assumption driving our policy, not fact, not evidence. Uh, so I'm quite I'm so certain about that. I would say from the on the basis of all the research that I've done, and that is into hundreds and hundreds of old texts online for the last 2,000 years from this country, well, this the UK, from uh, France from Spain and from North America and anywhere else I could get it where I could understand it. Um, plus going through hundreds and hundreds of building accounts in archives where they're listing out the materials they're using, you know exactly what they're using. Uh, I can say with, that, with pretty much certain, in my mind, I'm certain that the only purpose for which they prefer to use natural hydraulic lime over any other binder was for concrete floors and concrete building footings. And concrete building footings, only after 1815, uh, when uh, I think it was Robert Smirk in London, suddenly realized that instead of building a building foundation, you could dig a trench and fill it with concrete instead. And that was after 1815. We had a little dalliance with NHLs at the end of the 19th century. It's the first time that you see people suddenly talking about protecting the work, throwing buckets of water on the wall for as long as you could after you built that wall. Because natural hydraulic line demands loads of ongoing hydration. Far more than anybody in this country or in the world gives it, it needs to set properly. Um, so, they start, we did have a dalliance, so if you look at the 1912 edition of Mitra's construction, you know, a very classic, constantly re-revised re thing over time. In 1912, they say, you can use natural hydraulic lime for pretty much everything. 19, the next edition, 1947 edition, do not use natural hydraulic lime for building. So they learned a real lesson in the early 20th century. The, the, that lesson was mitigated by the fact that at that time what NHL they were using was largely displaced by cement lime mortars which gave you the same properties but in a predictable way and with actually more lime in them so they were more workable and so on uh, and just to finish that thing about workability work workability was the standard historically it wasn't BSE and 459 and all that nonsense. Workability was the standard. Even engineers, if the mortar was workable, they believed it was fit for purpose. You think, oh, are they pandering to me because I like a workable mortar? No, they're not. It's because workability indicates essential mortar properties. And the, the most particular is water retentivity which was a new concept on me when I came across it. I hadn't even thought about this sort of thing. 
water retentivity. And what that means is that the water you have, when you bed it to a porous background or when you bed a porous brick or whatever to it, it doesn't want to let it water go straight away into that porous material. It wants to hold on to it. It wants to hold it down and keep it in. And therefore it, it forms a good bond because you need that water retentivity. If you put a porous brick to a cement sand mortar, which has no water retentivity to speak of, wants to dry as fast as it possibly can. And because that's a hydraulic material, it needs water to set. Airline doesn't need water to set. It needs to get rid of water to set and replace it with carbon dioxide. Then you bed a brick to that. The water in, in the mortar of the contact zone is immediately extracted into the porous brick or stone. It, that water doesn't come back. It doesn't set properly. And, we're, and very often we're, we're not talking visible things here. We're talking microscopic but that will leave a capillary pathway between the mortar and the, if it hasn't set properly. The same would apply to NHL. I don't believe even anyone who advocates the use of NHL could pretend that that has any water retentivity at all. It, it wants to dry the moment you put it in the wall. That's why we have to keep spraying it. We have to keep spraying it actually to keep feeding it water because it needs that to set. But it, it will dry overnight, it will dry in hours, given a chance. It's got no water retentivity. You think, okay, well that's a pain in the arse, we've got to keep wetting it. That's not the point. The point is, because it's got no water retentivity, it makes a very poor bond and a poor extent of bond with the fabric and leaves capillary pathways. I can't speak for this area too much, I can for one particular building down the road. In North Yorkshire, I don't, I, I know very, very few buildings that have been pointed with NHL that are not permanently wet. That's all I can say. And I live in east, the east part of Britain. There's a reason for that. And that is exactly was exactly the experience when they used cement sand mortars back in the early late 19th, early 20th century. It's the reason that the US Bureau of Standards sat down and thought, what the hell is going on here? Uh, because they don't have cavity walls in America, they're building walls with cement sand mortars and they're leaking like sieves. So the US Bureau said, what's going on? So they then came up with cement line mortars as a, as a mortar that gave you pretty good workability because of the lime in it, but early rapid set because of the cement in it, early rapid initial set. And they under, and so the workability, the water retentivity comes from the lime again, the lime, high air lime content. Uh, and so 129, 1312, I mean, I'll give you an example. I was looking at some research recently. Sorry, Luke, you've heard all this yesterday when we were talking, but um, I was looking at some research recently. They looked at a number of NHLs. They tested the desorptivity, which is unusual. Most people just test how easily it'll absorb water which doesn't tell us very much, actually, in terms of capillarity. You need to know how, how it gets rid of, how quickly that water leaves once it's been wet. They did that, and they used a one cement, three lime, 12 mortar as a control. They didn't draw any conclusions to what they saw. I did. They showed that the one three twelve cement lime mortar had six times the water retentivity of the most water retentive of the NHLs they tested. Six times is a big difference. And that's exactly what the US standards are aiming to achieve. That you, we had the workability, therefore the water retentivity, therefore the full extent of bond. And they are very adamant that you could have the most porous material in the world. As long as that bond is a full extent, no water is going to get in to speak of. Whereas you could put the hardest, less, least breathable material in there instead. Common sense might say that's a good idea to keep the rain out. The building just gets soaking wet very quickly because of all these things. Lastly, on that front, when we work with <clears throat> airline mortars, lime rich, which they have to be and which we haven't been doing for the last 45 years, we're working with overly lean lime mortars whether it's lime putty mixed at one to three, 
that's at least half the lime they ever put in a mortar historically. We obviously know better. We thought, no, we know much better than them. We know much better than 9,000 years of history and practice in the last 100 years. We can just put half as much lime in and it will work just like it did in the past. No, of course it, did, it didn't work. So we, we were using a binder they didn't trust, lime putty, mixed, putting half as much of that in the mortar at least as they ever did. And then we wondered why it was failing all over the country. This is where buildings sell, it fails. Because they maybe were told to use lime putty. The response to that failure everywhere, which I remember, I've been around a long time in this industry, wasn't to say, are we using exactly what they did? Are we, are we, is it, no, are we doing what they did, is it really? Is it, that what, should we look at some old texts, perhaps? In the case of English heritage, I can say that because I'm in Scotland, they didn't even look at their own literature. So they didn't review their own literature on these matters. 1951, the Ministry of Works published a, a four-page or an eight-page brochure on lime mortars. that has got all the right mortar proportions, really. Talks about cement lime mortars. Um, and actually, when it comes to porous stone, porous sandstone, porous limestone, the mix is pure lime. It's done with hydrated lime or lime putty, not with hot mixing. But nonetheless, they say, and then they say, if with porous stone or you know, with porous sandstone, porous, if it is essential, in capital letters, essential to have early rapid hardening, put in a 15th part of Portland cement. That's a 1312. That's 1951, Ministry of Works, publication. Tells you how to slake the lime, all these things. They didn't even look at that in 1995 or whenever, seven and so on. Instead, John Ashurst stood up at the Building Lines Forum in 1997 and said, use imported NHL, it is great. They always used it in France, not true. There were still, I, there were people down in France I've heard recently who are still using earth lime mortars to build new houses, for God's sake. They were using earth lime mortars in France far longer than we were in this country because they didn't have enclosure that robbed us of access to the materials, ready access. We, here in Moffat, they had the right to take the clay from the common land. Once the common land, as they did in Moulton, in York, North Yorkshire, where I live, it's in the medieval charter, that the first right and privilege of the Burgesses of New Moulton was to take earth and stone for building and edification, as it says in the charter, from the wastelands, i.e. the common lands around the town. That was lost, so that, that's when we switched away in the masonry world from earth lime mortars in England, largely. But up here in Moffat, yeah, the same thing happened. Um, but anyway, so, where was I going? I was building up to a, a crescendo of anger and frustration. No, anyway, so yeah, they, that, that, and then the green light was given. It, it really was. And we all started using NHL. We had a brief period in, in that period and in between when we were using blue lias made down in Somerset. And that wasn't a damaging line. That, uh, this is the other thing to say. The natural hydraulic lines that we used in this country had far more air lime in them than the ones we, we have available to us today. So blue lias typically had about 72% free lime in it. So that, where I've used that, it hasn't done damage. It hasn't led to the building becoming wet. So there are issues around, there's not even a comparison between natural hydraulic lime historically and modern natural hydraulic lime. They're very different materials. Um, so that was the response to this failure. And no research was done. No research was done into the properties of NHL. It's why when you read most commentary about this and most academic papers about lime since then, they're based on, as I said right at the beginning, an assumption that they used natural hydraulic lime historically for everything. It's an assumption that there is no evidential base to that. Mortar analysis shows us that most mortars were non-hydraulic. Sometimes we get totally blown away. I mean, bridge footings on analysis tended to be built either with clay, logically, or with air lime that is fully carbonated. You say, oh, well, how is that? Well, 
probably because obviously they, when they built them, they had coffer dams and they let it carbonate before they let the water in. And that's fine. Airline won't, isn't water soluble. People, you'll read people saying to you it's water soluble. It's not, not in any meaningful way is it water soluble. It's no more than limestone is. It, it is to, you know, over many, many centuries and with acid rain and things, it's not a water soluble material. So as long as it can carbonate, it's not going to wash away. Food for thought, anyway. But um, so that I, I'm being very brutal. But I, 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 I'm at the point now. I've read all of this. I've done all of this. I've processed all of this, and I'm getting less and less tolerant of any idea that there is any kind of equivalence between natural hydraulic lime and lime. The, the true definition, the, the, the proper dictionary definition of lime, is not natural hydraulic. It's, it's lime, which is mostly calcium carbonate, or when it's formed, when it's set. So, and just the idea that it's an option, it's a choice. I, to me, it's not. Uh, it's not a meaningful choice. Uh, so anyway, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, you said earlier about you might reserve it for chimneys still. And I was, uh, Emma was doing the work on Hampton Court. She's been using NHL too, I think, up there. But given what you just said about bridge footings, and they're, they're super wet all the time. <laughs> I mean, are you even coming to the point where you might say that even a chimney, an exposed chimney... Well, I, haven't, I, I will just give you, you prompted me. I'll just give you a, some little in, some things from the actual... Because I probably that's where I was going, actually. Uh, sorry, I, I'm a bit random the word. I've got too much in my head. But um, the NHL research has been done. Yeah, it was commissioned by Historic England. That is the research that should have been done in 1997. Quite clearly. Before they said use this for everything um, so and the outcomes of that research are pretty horrifying that research is not widely available currently it came out it was finished in 2018 I can't talk to you on camera why it's not available but it's I can give it to you if you want it I've got the permission of the author and the supervisor to share it but only one to one under no circumstances can we put that up onto the internet at this moment in time. This will happen, this will emerge, but to give you a few insights from that, the simplest experiment, the simplest test they did was to buy two bags of the same NHL brand, same number, on the same day in two parts of England, and to test them both in two different labs independently, and uh, when they made a mortar, one of those was 30% stronger than the other. That's the same brand, same number, same day. In the testing between all of the brands available to us, they were all tested. The strongest on test was an NHL 3.5, Round Tower 3.5. The weakest on test was an NHL 3.5. Say Astier. It's one of the reasons I said it's the one if you do use it to use. So say Astier, the difference between those two, so the strongest is a 3.5, you would expect it to be a 5. The weakest is a 3.5, you would expect it to be a 2. Uh, the difference in strength after three years is three times. So the strongest, three times stronger than the weakest, they're both NHL 3.5 in in several of the brands, their NHL 2s are stronger than their 5s. In one particular company's brand, when you put the three together, you can't see the difference. Because they're all the same bloody thing in different numbered bags. It's the only conclusion you can draw from that. And that's a, that's a test that's been repeated in America and showing the same outcome. So that it's not. Uh, so. All we can say is that standard is utterly meaningless, tells us absolutely nothing, deceives us, and it was it was designed to deceive. Uh, again, brutally, and don't get me wrong, I'm I'm not a Brexiteer at all. It's horrifying that we left the EU, and look what's happening subsequently. Um, but the EU, I mean, they we spent between us the Europe and Britain spent most of the 20th century trying to evolve, trying to set a, set a standard for NHL. And you couldn't do it because it is just an inherently variable material that you cannot standardize. And so 
in order for the EU, because most of the line produ NHL producers are in the EU, in order for them to be able to sell to specifiers and others, they created a standard that is so broad as to be meaningless. So in NHL 5, yeah, the standard demands that it reaches 5 MPA, 5 Newtons, after 28 days. It can reach 15 MPA, so it could be three times stronger than that after 28 days and still be called an NHL 5. Similarly, a 2 can be, needs to reach 2, but can reach 7 MPA. So you can see there's an overlap in the standard between all of these. All of the ones that we tested are within that standard. They're not breaking the standard. It's just that the standard is crap. So, but of course it's deceived a lot of people. Yeah, let's use NHL 2, that's softer. Actually, it's not necessarily, <laughs> uh, and so on. You just don't know. And you don't know from one day to the next. And this was known historically. This is why they didn't use it. And that variability in strength. You can't sensibly, or you shouldn't sensibly build a solid wall construction with mortars that are varying in strength throughout that elevation. That's just structural madness. So a lot of the build, some of the buildings, at least down south, I know, having spoken to guys who've built new build with NHL, one bricklayer in particular, he has to go back every year to close, to fill step cracking in the wall. Either that's saying it needed an expansion joint, i.e. it's not what it pretends to be, because the whole argument is it doesn't need a reason. So, you know, I, I don't want really to labour that too much. Well, I do, but you need to understand it. The, we have no basis on which to specify NHL. We do not know when they get when they finish getting stronger. I would say it's probably at least 10 years. And the, the other thing to say is that we use that 28-day time span because that's, that's the period in which cement gains most of its strength, 95% of its strength in the first 28 days. NHLs develop the, their period of maximum strength gain is actually six months. So they, they shoot up over six months. And then after that, we've got a steady climb in all of them in the research. A steady climb which amounts to half a newton a year thereafter. Half a newton a year over 10 years, that's five more newtons. Over 20 years, that's 10 more newtons. Do you see what I'm saying? But the, in conservation terms, the simple fact that there is not an NHL producer out there who can tell us when their material stops gaining strength is reason never to use it, because we don't know what it is. That's a basic conservation principle, isn't it? As is like for like. We've not been working like for like at all in the line arrival. Not working like for like with line putty at one to three. Certainly not working like for like with NHL at any proportion. <laughs> so these are it's important things to understand. Yeah. The last thing I want to say on that performance technical front and I will be reiterating I don't know if you're coming to the talk I'm doing on Thursday but I will be reiterating these but the US Bureau of Standards also look I mean they did amazing research believe me I mean I there's no comparable research ever been done in this country as to what was done in the US all around the world people think we know what we're talking about in Britain we're the experts on conservation so whenever I go abroad my first thing to do is to actually apologize for leading them astray <laughs> as a representative of this country. They're using NHL in Canada as much as they can at the moment, because we do. There is no natural hydraulic limestone in North America. <laughs> they never used any because they didn't have it, and yet they're now using it there. I read a, a guy, a Chinese architect, wrote a paper recently saying, oh, well, uh, you know, traditionally in China the, the building mixes 70 parts earth, subsoil, 30 parts lime. That's the traditional mortar, and then pointed with lime. That's what the Great Wall of China is built with for the most part, pointed with pure, pretty much pure lime. And they are now hot mixing that again, they've been out in China, because they realize they were using the wrong thing on the... But this architect says, so yeah, that's right, but, but in Europe, they're using NHL. Perhaps we should too. And you, you're just shouting at the paper, no, 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 you know, you've got it right in China. You don't need to be destroying your buildings now just because we do <laughs> but anyway so the, the last thing because the, the main frustration you will find as homeowners we all find 
is that when we have as much lime as we should in the mortar and it's air lime, we will get some shrinkage in the first 24 hours after placement. Some little bits of shrinkage. There are, there are, we'll be talking about this through the week. There are ways you can reduce that potential without causing a problem, but we won't talk about that now. So you, you just have to accept that some shrinkage is almost inevitable, either in a plaster or in a pointing mortar. But that shrinkage happens in the first 24 hours, typically. So the mortar, because it's highly water retentive, is still plastic at that point. You can close that shrinkage up with a stick or whatever, press it together, and in, as part of your aftercare, you just knock the whole thing back with the brush. Now, what the US Bureau of Standards demonstrated very clearly is that is the only shrinkage that a pure lime mortar will ever experience in its lifetime. And its lifetime, believe me, can be 500 years. And there's no reason why what we're doing now, that these mortars will not last indefinitely. You know, we've had this idea that lime mortars last 25 years, or maybe 50 if we use NHL, that's the cycle. These will last hundreds of years. The ones we're making too, as long as we're confident we're doing what they did, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. We are. I'm confident. We could have nicer lime available, but we'll talk about that as well. Um, on the other hand, hydraulic materials, cement, natural hydraulic lime, they will shrink in their life. They don't shrink much at all initially in the first 24 hours but they will shrink up to four times the volume of that shrinkage you get in an airline in their lifetime, but only after they've set hard. We did a church, a trial panel in the church in Holy, on Holy Island where they used NHL 3.5, say ASTIA, I know that, uh, in 1999. A, there was a gap, there was about a quarter of a mil gap, a quarter of an inch gap between the mortar and the stone across that whole wall. The inside wall was vivid green. I mean, this thick in the church there on Holy Island was vivid green with algae. That's shrinkage. And that's partly to do with this ongoing strength gain. It's shrinking as a result. Every time cement, as I said earlier, every time cement or natural hydraulic lime get wet in the rain, they expand a little bit. Then they shrink when they dry. That's all about so that shrinkage is going to happen, but it's going to happen down the road. So it's why cement comes loose. Cement doesn't come loose just because it's, as we tend to say, incompatible because it's so much harder than what's there already. It's because of its own nature that it expands and contracts when it gets wet, that it comes loose and lets water in. And it's, its incompatibility is that it doesn't breathe. It's not actually that it's just, just the fact of being too hard. We can make very hard hot mix of lime rich mortars. They won't be in compatibility. That's the way the, the compatibility lies in compatible behavior of movement of liquid phase water. That's really where the compatibility is. So, um, so that again is significant. And that, that's what contributes to this durable bond with a lime mortar that doesn't break. We've got a building over there that's pointed that's built with earthy lime mortars, pointed with lime. We can go and look at that later when we walk around. But, okay, so I'm going to... This happened the other day. I, I stood in the same place so I, and I started to walk and my leg had gone to sleep. <laughs> but anyway, right. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to start at the beginning. So, well, you work with earth. What's the biggest problem about working with earth? Getting the earth, isn't it? <laughs> That's the problem. <coughs> Very few farmers are going to give you earth. So you end up scrounging it, building sites if you're lucky. Hardly got a garden, all my gardens. Yeah, yeah. Right, well, I'm going to let you in onto a, a big secret that I got so ridiculously excited about this. Does anyone here play cricket? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Cricket loan. Do you know what that is? Yeah. yeah. I'd never heard of that. I didn't know any. Anyway, so yeah, any cricket wicket has cricket loam spread on it through the through the year to harden it up. And they do tennis loam as well for grass courts. So here we go. There it is. 
You can all take a photo of that if you want. Because this is a top tip. <laughs> if you want to use Earth, now obviously it's not local. Yo, know, all that. But this is cricket loam. And the other problem with Earth building is that architects can't specify it. Because it's all about feel, isn't it? You can't specify feel. Which is a good, that's why we used to design all the mortars. They, they did, you know. I mean, and that, because we know what the feel should be like and so on as craftspeople, but I'm not, I'm not making a classes point there, but I haven't said that, and it is important, it's in the book. <coughs> I think it was in my technical paper for Historic Scotland, and I think there has been a complaint, apparently, from, uh, from an architect, and I, I don't know what the complaint was exactly about, but I, this is what it was about, I'm sure. What is clear, again, from all the old texts is that mortars were designed by the craftspeople who used them, always, and, and that was always the case. Uh, that changed, that shifted in the 19th century, it started to shift from about the middle of the 19th century where you suddenly get, not necessarily architects, but professionals, experts, self-appointed, saying whatever craftspeople do, however craftspeople make their mortars, it must be wrong because they're just lazy and indolent. This is 1857 that quote comes from. Uh, another engineer, Henry Scott, uh, he says, I, I look forward to the day when workmanship, well, work, the craft practice and uh, so on, is no longer a consideration in the design of mortars. And I, I'm going to design mortars properly because I'm an expert. Henry Scott, you may have heard of Scott Cement. He invented Scott Cement, patented it on the back of condemning craft practice and knowledge. Uh, Scott cement was a mixture of natural hydraulic lime and gypsum for exterior renders. I, d I don't think I need to say more, really, do I? <laughs> that failed catastrophically everywhere. So this expert who looked forward to the day when he could design the mortars and blah, forget the craftsmen and, and women, which there were even then. Um, so, yeah, and I would and that that campaign because it was a campaign. Coupled with, of course, changing building technology, suddenly we've got steel beams and things that are not within the, the natural knowledge of a builder, a local builder, they tended to have to be specified. And so you get increasing involvement in that regard. And, and architects really took control of the more design process from the beginning of the 20th century in this country, you would say, much later elsewhere. Uh, and I, you know, I can't avoid saying that it's since then that it's all gone wrong. You know, because they want very precise materials, hydrated lime, cement that is provable, and so on. Uh, and and that is where it did go wrong. But anyway, so yeah, loam. Because when we talk about earth borders, we are really talking about loam. Uh, that's what they're using. That's what you see them calling it. Uh, Loam is a very specific thing. I don't think it was quite as specific historically. So this is loam. It's 31% clay. Too much, actually. What? Yeah. 38% silt, which I am certain in, a, in an earth mortar or an earth lime mortar, the silt is as important as the clay. It's not good enough to get clay and mix sharp sand with it. The silt plays a, performs a really effective role in that mortar and the rest is five mil down uh, sand and and because it's manufactured I mean it's blended uh, and spread on wickets <laughs> it's always the same now from a vernacular point of view okay that's not necessarily the best thing that it's always the same and it comes from Essex uh, but but it does unlock our ability to use earth in a very, in a much better way. You know, much, we can specify it, we can do all sorts. There's a guy down in Devon sells premixed earth plasters for eco build, 70 pounds for 25 kilograms. Do you really want to pay 70 pounds for mud? But this, three pound 50 a bag. Um, I'm not going to say any more, sorry, I, I get, I keep having to remember I'm on camera. £3.50 a bag, right? 
Now, as I said just now, there's too much clay in there. So I wouldn't use this just as it comes out of the bag. <coughs> I'll improve it or change its nature by putting some sand in, which is cheaper than £3.50 a bag. So that's bringing the unit cost down even more, isn't it? So, okay, so let's, we're just, so we'll start with an earth mortar and then we'll make it into an earth lime mortar. Um, uh, oh, I'm supposed to do the health and safety, right, I'll just get this gauge down. I'm supposed to talk about health and safety, aren't I? I'll talk about that when we get going with the quick line. But. So, one gauge of, of that loam. And then I'm going to put in a gauge of fine sharp sand, not coarse sharp sand. It's actually got five mil in there. I wish it didn't have, but it does. Um, so, so there's a 50-50 mix now with sand. So. I mean, all I'm doing there is bringing down the clay proportion because we don't really want more than 20% clay. And actually, most mortars I've had analysed from the North Yorkshire area, earth line mortars, it tends to be about 12% clay. Uh, I've seen them with even less than that, which they're not so good. A bit rubbery or right a bit. But, um, so, okay, and then water. So. Trying to do, a, trying to be fair to this material, but so I don't want to overwet it at this moment. I mean, with most earthwork, you would tend to soak your material, the earth before use, like 24 hours before, if you can. In Bhutan and places where they still routinely use earth, they they just have the heaps of earth out in the weather for a year or more. But, um, Sorry, I forgot. Could you get me bring out one of those the cow bugs? So I think you can see that's a nice material. That's just the loam. Yeah, so it's pretty sticky. Pretty cohesive, pretty adhesive, and so on. Um, so you, you know, one of the questions you'd ask if you're building with this is, "What well, do I need any lime at all to change that?" That's pretty good. Um, and of course, we don't always see lime added. However, I mean, earth lime mortars were the were the standard, the general mortar of construction in the Roman Empire. We, tend to think, oh, they just use hydraulic lime. No, the earth lime was the dominant mortar of construction, as it was all over the world. You can, uh, but you, but on the other hand, you might find just earth. It's that they're making choices. The French talk about this far more, um, about earth building and all the different variations and so on. But you'll often see in the French text a proportion of one to five, one line to five is slate lime, that is. So, um, but as I bring this up wetter, which, you know, depending on what we're doing with it, you would have it pretty wet. You can see that the water is available. And the other thing about <coughs> clay, of course, is that clay also expands and swells and shrinks as it gets wet and dry. Um, and you can see we've got available water here. So I'm going to make that even wetter now. For a minute. <clears throat> oh. That part's going to be white by the end of this week. I guess there's no question about that. So we've got a lot of available water now. 
Um, and that's not, I mean, for a plaster, that's about the consistency I would want it, actually, for an earth plaster. But if it was earth plaster, I'd have other stuff in it. Around here, it was hair, because they had lots of cows around here. Um, in, in Yorkshire, it's, uh, it tends to be hay that was added, not straw, hay. Um, I tend to use hemp shiv, I don't know about you, but... Yeah, hemp shiv is why that if it was going to be a plaster, and that's again to resist the shrinkage when you apply it. Yeah, so but now I'm going to just put in a bit of lime, and that, that's the interesting thing here is it's quite a different story to the hot mixes where we have a load of lime, we don't need much lime to transform an earth more into something different. Uh, and of course, it's a stabilizer that's one of its key roles, it stops that tendency for swell and shrinkage in the clay because it stabilizes the clay so we, you'll hear of lime stabilized soil it does other things but um, right so uh, what I've got here is powdered quick lime So, and that's pretty stiff at the moment, but I think it makes the point. You can see that's changed that material quite dramatically, hasn't it? From what it wasn't a bad material before at all. But now that's really eminently sticky. There's no free water. That's the key thing I'd want you to draw your eye to. There's no available water in this mix. It's not free, it's not loose. There's no mortar other than a quick line mortar that delivers that absence of free water all the others are running in water. That translates into, I mean, what you're seeing there is the water retentivity of the material. That's, it's locking that water in. It's locking everything together, including the water. And that's, there's no science in what I just said there. That's just my observation. But that's the only way I can summarize it or make sense of it. Everything is locked together. That's not the case with the other mortars. They're not locked together in the same way in the mix before you start building or anything. And you've got a very moldable material there. Obviously you'd make that wetter if it was for plastering and so on. But, uh, and that's, that's what I call workability. That's a beautifully workable mortar. That's very sticky, very cohesive and very adhesive. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, and can spread. And if I bed something, but will receive a load, but at the same time resist that load. So you press a stone into it or, you know, and it finds a level. It fills every little crevice in that stone. Every little indent is filled by that material as you press it in. So, and obviously you can see if you're building and you, you buster a perp joint, it stays on the perp joint. It doesn't fall straight down, which is, and therefore probably never get filled at all. You know, which I've seen hundreds of years of that when we're using cement or other things, because you very difficult to fill a perp joint with a material that won't stay on your trowel. Can you imagine? You know, you're trying to shovel it in somehow. But uh, so that's an earth lime mortar, essentially. Uh, and the, you're often, I just all I'd say to you is, if you come across mortars that you think are earth, look closely. <laughs> so I mean, that one you don't have to look that closely. Loads of lime in there, loads of lime lumps. But earth, and this one uniquely in my current experience, 
Bill Reavy, the anal analyst, was certain this is from my village. The most of, most of the aggregate in this is uh, sand from the Beck, so very, very fine. Uh, and then he's adamant that they deliberately, consciously, added 9% clay to the mortar. A real no-no, that, isn't it? You don't want clay in your mortar. You don't want mud in your mortar. But they added the mortar, in, the lime, in, the clay into that mortar. This is 18th century from the kitchen garden wall, high status. Um, and I don't get, and earth lime mortars are not a thing of state. The Castle Howard is built with earth lime mortars. You, know, you don't know very often because obviously they're pointed with lime. And earth lime mortars, again, utterly ignored by the conservation world. Even Earth Building UK likes to try and ignore them. <laughs> So it's a, we're in a ridiculous situation. We've got the building lines for and we don't want to take, uh, don't really have much time for earth lime. Not everyone, but in the past. Because it's got mud in it. And then you've got the earth building people who don't want to take them too seriously because they've got lime in it. And it's just a ridiculous. Any, sorry, I keep forgetting I'm on camera. I'm going to regret some of these things I'm saying. Anyway, right. No, that, that's an earth How long that stay workable, that mixture of the space? Oh, it, indefinitely, as long as it doesn't dry. Yeah. You, you can keep it and set it aside. So if it dries off, yeah, I mean, a, a you'll, you'll see actually if you put water on it, it won't, it won't generally soak into it because it resists the water penetration once you've got it mixed. But, uh, and if you add more water, typically, it'll lock it in again. It's, uh, I, I, I wish some scientists would bloody do this what's necessary for us to understand what's going on, but um, the, there was a, a brilliant report I came across written by Reba Committee after the war, and it's a wonderful thing. It's about new build and how we're going to build a new world after the war and all that. But they actually say at the beginning, the job of science is to explain the good sense of traditional building, not to keep inventing new things. <laughs> to stick on new buildings, to actually just explain why it is that they are the best form of construction. Very little science does that, even today, you know. So, I just, I just want to, because I'm digging into the, I normally pass these around, but of course we can't really, but, but you're way rather than coming over around here, I'll talk to you about them another time, but, you know, as, as your dad, granddad, or whoever, well, he probably used lines, so he wouldn't say that, but modern ones, that's, there's nothing there. I can't crush that between my thumb and my forefinger at all. All that is, is a bit of lime wash that sat in my bucket after I'd finished lime washing. A hot lime wash, so much thicker than the rubbish you, we've been using, this seven water thing coats nonsense. Hot lime wash, and that is, you know, I mean, you can't, that's not a weak material is what I'm saying to you. And there's nothing that, beyond the lime, there's only pigment, a little bit of pigment in there. So it's just pure lime. But hot, made hot, and then, and yeah. So, that's the one I start with when I do things with builders. So right, lime soft, cross that between your thumb and your forefinger and your palm. Gibdin, a guy writing in the early 20th century, said, look, you don't need to go to a laboratory. You don't need to do that. You with your knowledge of what mortars should look like and be like, if you get a bit of it like that and you cannot crush that between your thumb and your forefinger, that is fit for purpose. That's all you need to know, you know. Uh, so anyway, right, what are we doing for time? Sorry. Um, 10.30. Oh, that's all right, because we're having a break at 11. Okay, right, I'm going to do the health safety bit then. Um, quick line. It's really dangerous. We know that. There's plenty of people out there who will tell you that. Um, it's a hazardous material. Of course it's a hazardous material. So is Portland cement. So is natural hydraulic lime. Uh, the European Lime Association risk assessment for working with quick lime differs in no way to the risk assessment for working with cement, other forms of lime, and so on. That's the first thing to say. Because you'll read horror stories. When we first popped up at the Building Lines Forum uh, six years ago or so and started really pushing this and aren't talking about it, the first attempt to shut us down was to say, oh, it's just too dangerous. 
nobody can do that in the modern world. And again, you start, you think, okay, so they did it for nine, seventeen thousand years, and it was not considered dangerous. They didn't. I mean, I've got plenty of pictures of guys. I mean, there's a great picture. Of, <laughs> well, I say great. It's not really great, but it's. I mean, the lime kiln in Spain that still works down in uh, near Jerez is a museum, and they've got the lime kiln. There's, I've got a great picture of the guy when it's finished burning. It's a big kiln up in the kiln, just raking down the quick lime lump lime. No gloves, no no sleeves, no mask, no goggles. Just I'm not recommending you do that when you start burning your own line. But but nonetheless, you've got to say. I mean, that guy's in his seventies. <laughs> Been doing it a long time. So we can over egg the hazard, the danger. We do need to accept the hazard. If there's danger, it comes from you not knowing what you're doing. But you can't just ban a material because somebody might wander in and buy a bag of quicklime, can you? I mean, you need to understand how to do it. And if you do it as it was done, there is really minimal hazard or minimal danger. But if you get lime or cement or NHL in your eye, you need to deal with it and you need to deal with it fast. Yeah, that's the primary danger. Um, what you shouldn't tend to put in your eye is uh, saline, which is what we have in our kids normally. Salt and lime locked together very efficiently chemically. You don't really want that happening in your eye. <laughs> uh, it'll make it worse is essentially the thing if you have salt, put saline in. So water, yeah, or ideally sugary water. So sugary water, acid versus alkaline, neutralizes that in your eye, yeah? And you, but you get it in there quick. And if you get it in there within a minute or so, then uh, you really shouldn't know this much has ever happened. If you do it with water, you'll tend to have a red eye for a week, <laughs> and so on. So sugary water is the thing, yeah? And not saline. Of course, the people who are telling us we were advise it, telling people everyone that they should do something incredibly dangerous didn't weren't saying oh well, you shouldn't use saline no that was the lime industry who told us that so we again and so it's a hazardous material if it gets incredibly wet it can cause fires i mean if, if you've got it stored and it gets a little bit of water that can get very very hot and that's the key thing if if quick lime receives far too little water to slake it it can get very hot indeed. I mean, it, it can reach four, five hundred degrees centigrade in within a minute. Yeah, I mean that. And, uh, so, I mean, I was, I've been reading a little book about the Rockland mine, uh, lime industry in North America, and yeah, they they had it all in wooden sheds on the quayside, but you can imagine it's on a quayside, and it used to flood occasionally. The sea would you know come into the buildings, and they yeah, several of them burned down over the years. But that's because, but that's not because it's quick lime. It's because it's quick lime that is receive far too little water to slake it and therefore can get really hot. Um, sorry, I just decided whether I should tell you something or not, but I mean, <laughs> no, I can't. Well, I can if I don't say who it was. Some guys who were experimenting and, and trying to work out the reactivity of this locally burned lime uh, recently, they and they felt they noticed a slight change in reactivity between batches. So they, they put, they pulverized it and they put it in a bucket, a metal bucket, up to the top with powder quick lime. But then they put in a little bit of water that you know, they weren't quite up on more, and put in a little bit of water. So that went down to the bottom obviously and started to slake. And obviously it was then getting very hot down there because there wasn't enough water to slake it. Plus, because it's powder, the air couldn't get out. The steam that was being generated <laughs> couldn't escape. So they filmed this. They stood around watching this and think, oh, no. And then it suddenly goes, bang! And the whole top of the line just flew off because uh, they just put it like a pressure cooker. Mm. Now that, yeah, so, okay. That's quite hazardous. But only because they didn't know what they were doing. That's the point. So... That's what I'm going to stress to you now. So we're going to, I'm going to start, we do two mixes, just to 
show you the general mixing method historically. Um, and then we'll have a break. And then we'll mix the mixes we are going to use. You know, it's a different method for it because we're using powdered quick lime. But I do want to show you the method with lump quick lime. And hopefully that will just show you what this material is like, what it does to some extent. So, in the earth water. Did that, did that get hot? Uh, yeah, warm, but warm. not that hot. I mean, yeah, this it's a weird thing. The, the, what's happening in an earth lime moor is not the same as is happening in a what you what we're what's developing in there. What will develop is a very feeble hydraulic set. Yeah. So you, and again, scientists will deny this, except some. If you ever read any chemist about this, Robert Boynton, who was an American chemist. Yeah, he's adamant, and he's also adamant that it's, it's good to have some clay, which is why I like that bit more. Eh? The, you know, the fact that traditional dug sands had some clay in them is a good thing, not a bad thing, because you'll get a very feeble hydraulic reaction between the clay and the lime. So an earth lime mortar that sets by drying and reaction doesn't need to carbonate. It's not that it won't carbonate, but it doesn't need to carbonate to set, whereas the mortars we're about to mix need to carbonate to set. Um, so there's a different thing going on in there, because it, it does defy what I'm about to say to you about temperature of slake and so on. Um, but yeah, Robert Boynton is, is excellent. So I'm going to do, actually for these mixes, I am going to do a more, so we've got core sharp sand. I don't want to overload you with stuff, because I mean, this is a, a constantly evolving understanding that we've got here. Don't believe anything that I say to be definitive, it isn't. I think we have a very good understanding of the basics, but the nuances is what we're really exploring at the moment, isn't it? more and more. So, and one of those, which shouldn't seem like a nuance, of course, is that for the last, certainly for the last 25 years, it's been routine to say that we should use coarse, sharp aggregate for lime mortars. Now Luke, and you, you live in a part of the country where you do often see quite coarse aggregate, you know, slate and so on in the, in the mixes. I rarely see uh, very sharp sand, coarse sharp sand in mortars, historic mortars. In my, in my part of North Yorkshire the main aggregate is limestone dust, actually. limestone, not sand and, and very fine river sand like that. Um, of, of the majority of the more analyses I've had done in this, in there and in elsewhere, 94% of the aggregate goes through a one millimeter sieve. And usually 80% of it goes through a half a millimeter sieve. So that defies what we've been saying for the last, in my opinion. But there's no question that most mortars, historically, hot mix mortars, airline mortars, were made with very fine sand. The same as the earth line mortars, it's very fine material that's in there, silt and sand. I mean, silt and clay, I mean, sorry. On analysis, the vast majority of that is goes through a half a millimetre of silicon. It's really fine material. The reason we would say that you don't use soft, I mean, you don't use fine, sharp sand, and stress that, fine, sharp, it still has to be sharp, is that it would shrink far too much. My experience is the opposite of that. It shrinks less than if I made it all with a coarse sharp sand. So there's something, yeah, you know, this is still evolving thinking in my head, but we've got we can't keep ignoring the fact that most of the mortars we see historically are made with really fine aggregate. And it's not just because they couldn't get sharp aggregate. So that's just food for thought. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier on about breaking down slate. Well, I mean, are you suggesting that slate can be used as aggregate if it's, if it's powdered? Oh, yeah, it, it is in Wales a lot, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I've got about eight tons of delaminated Lancashire slate. Oh, well, yeah, place. pulverize it up. Yeah. 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 You'll get some Botslandic reaction from the dust from that as well, the slate dust. Okay. But we'll talk about Botslands right. in another session, really. But so. My typical mix these days tends to be one of the coarse and sharp, but two of the finer, generally speaking. Um, 
we will in this this job we will be you doing the other way we'll be doing two course of one fine but um, of course when we were putting in far too little line because NHLs when they were used were never mixed at one to three either they were always mixed at one to two or one to one um, then yeah with, with there's far more surface area to cover in a, in a fine sand so that may be why we got that impression but of course we're putting twice as much lime in as that so every grain of that sand is covered and locked to one another by lime so that's the difference I would say technically but um, so okay that's that mix there So this is a scaled down version of what they would be doing on the ground. So I mix those two together. Then I'm going to um, make a ring of the sand. Wherever you are in the world, or wherever I've seen, this method, which is for lump lime, bear in mind, uh, is called the ordinary or the common method. So, yeah, this is what they're doing most of the time for most use in ends with lump lime, which is the cheapest way, still is, to buy, you know, the, the powder quick lime costs more than the lump lime. If, but we can't get very big lump lime in this country anymore commercially. So, this is the form that's used most in Scotland because it's from just across the border in Shap. This is the, the form there. So, you, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to really call that lump line, but it's, it's lumps, it's, it's kibbled, is what it, it's called. Five mil down from Shap, so carboniferous limestone. Uh, do, do, do you understand how lime is made? Sorry, I should go right back to the basics of it. Yeah, just, you know, in a kiln, drive off all the calcium, uh, sorry, the, uh, the carbon dioxide <laughs> and the water. What comes out looks exactly as it did when it went into the kiln, but is up to 44% lighter because of the loss of those things. And it is that water, that molecular water effectively, is what it wants back, desperately, yeah? So you can, you can give it just that water back and you'll end up with a dry powder, because that's the, I, I don't know if that's the right term, but you know what I mean? Molecular water, water you can't see that's in the body of the material, that, and so it presents as a dry powder. That's all it needs back. It doesn't need any more, but we give it more because of what we're doing with it. This on the other hand, so that's commercially burned. They burn typically at a higher temperature than traditionally in the modern lime works for various reasons. But primarily is it's a they say it prolongs shelf life. But anyway, we'll we'll look at that. This however is stuff I burned, this is Portland stone. So you can see it's just off cuts from when I'm working stone. Uh, and I, I should just, with a couple of these, I don't know where that clink came from. I think that's from the fuel work. Uh, it was so, sorry, I won't type it into that. Sorry, it's okay. so, uh, this, this one, this is just something else. But I'm just going to put these, so I'm just soaking these in water, letting them absorb all the water they can. And then I'm just going to pop them down there. And you can wait and see if anything happens. But, um, so, I 
And because it's lighter, you can, you know, if you've got stuff that hasn't perhaps burned, you can feel that as you source it, you can feel that it's light, therefore it's, it's certainly com converted in the kiln. So then the lump line would go in the middle of the uh, of the ring, and in this case, in terms there. Of sorry, in terms of judging your kind of quantities, there obviously with the the lump line, it's a bit harder to get an exact. Yeah, you. I mean, they again, they talk about uh, a fair measure and a strop measure historically. So yeah, that one could be done with a strop measure, yeah. quite a little bit of mounding to take account of the voids. And as you say, you need to estimate the voids in there. Um, because it, it, what we're about to do is critical to everything. So that, and I, so, so as you say, this material, Desperately wants his water back, and uh, once we give it that water, it's going to get hot by exothermic reaction and and slake. So, but the quant the volumes of water that we slake with are critical to the outcome and to the performance. And this is you know so as I say, we 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 were mixing one slake line to three. Now, the, the simplest. Um, excuse for that if you like is that when you read old texts you you will often see one line to three one line to three sometimes one lump line to three the point is whenever they said until relatively recently whenever they said lime in that context they meant quick lime it was assumed because that's all you pretty much use we interpreted that as being one slight line to three vitruvius apparently says one slate line to three for pit sand, one to two for other sands. But Vitruvius in, in that kind of detail is an unreliable witness, not for any fault of his, this is the Roman engineer, but because that was so translated and translated and translated. And it, it was only in the 15th, 16th century that a monk who was a builder tried to rationalize that translation because it had become so confused by things being translated by people who didn't use the materials. There are two experts, maybe he did mean that. I doubt that he did. I'm pretty certain that he meant one quick line to three for pit sand and one quick line to two for river sand. I'm pretty certain of that in truth. But of course that led us all astray as well because he seems to say one to three. The other explanation is maybe he did mean one to three, but pit sand had a lot of clay in it. So maybe he didn't feel he needed more than that. That's, those are my two rationalizations of that. <coughs> but of course it was taken by the Lime Revival who looked to the Roman example. All I can say to you is that every more Roman more uh, uh, I've seen analyzed comes back as having been mixed with one quick line to three or one quick line to two in its proportions. So, you know, whatever Vitruvius is saying, whoever were, the Romans that were building here in this country were using what I'm about to do now, that proportion. And that proportion is right through history. On analysis, most mortars come in as one to one and a half, one line to one and a half aggregate on analysis, or richer in lime than that. The point is they're never leaner in lime. This is the magnitude of the error we made. With, with lime putty, even lime putty that is properly made, which most modern lime putty maybe isn't, throwing the maybe in for the camera there, um, <laughs> that they wouldn't recognise what is being sold today as lime putty as being lime putty historically. It's, it's, we'll make some properly to, in, in the course of this week, so you can see the difference. Whenever bread, uh, lime putty is discussed, it's described as having, uh, being a bread dough consistency. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. Well, should we just, we're just slightly, 
No, yeah. we won't. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. We'll have to do both. As, as long as you don't mind us going like straight through. Yeah, no, I'll, 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 I'll just finish this sentence. So, so, yeah, so one to three. Now, <clears throat> William Patton, Charles, is it William? Charles Pasley, engineer in the early 19th century, because the, the main accusation in the London area was that masons, and particularly bricklayers, would put far more lime in than was necessary because it makes it so nice and sticky and so on. So he sat down and said, right, I am going to work out what is the maximum amount of sand that you could put to one quick line without compromising workability or performance. And he, his conclusion was the maximum amount of sand that you could put to one pure line quick line was three parts. Effectively, we were putting six parts. So half as much. But what I was going to say about lime putty, yeah, even the prop appropriately dense lime putty, about 30% of its volume is water, not lime. So if you mix that at a struck level, which most people did, you're not even getting one part of lime putty to three parts of sand. You might be getting one to four. So even less than half what they used to put into any mortar. Yeah, this is really important. The two things that are universal all over the world, all through history, are lime sand, lime aggregate proportion, and slaking method. Uh, and I was going to do the slaking method, but we'll wait for after tea, after a tea break. Yeah, I just hope it doesn't rain in the meantime. <laughs> I mean, you can come in closer, it's not going to explode or anything. <laughs> We're not looking at a off camera, a York Minster scenario. I <laughs> <laughs> don't want to drop it. I've got the video, I'd love to put it on my website. We would just feed the uh, idiots who say this is too dangerous to show that. But it's, it's just don't do this, would be the uh, strap line. But, um, but no, I, I burn magnesium lime for. York Minster, which they're using on the building, which they hot mix. Um, that's a feebly hydraulic lime, but we'll talk about these distinctions as we go on. We're using a feebly hydraulic lime on the on the wall here. It's uh, from Germany. It comes, but um, but it's not called a feebly hydraulic lime because it doesn't meet the standard. It's too weak to be part of the standard. And, but we used to have a standard that there was always a British standard for feebly hydraulic lime. And that was that it would reach between 0.7 and 2 MPA in 28 days. And that's, you can see, below the threshold of, of what we tend to call feebly hydraulic lime, NHL 2. But actually, according to VCAS definitions, the original ones, where we had feebly, moderately and eminently hydraulic lime, there's no question that uh, the weakest NHL2 on the market, VCAL would have considered to be an eminently hydraulic line. So again, don't think there is any equivalence between 2, 3.5 and 5, and feebly, moderately and eminently hydraulic line. There is no equivalence there. Yeah? So, right, okay, now, slaking water, and this is critical. Every text you'll read about lime anywhere in the world will say several things. One thing they will say is that you must always, always, iron rule, add water to quicklime, not add quicklime to water. And here we're back in the territory of the lime revival because the iron rule throughout the lime revival has been that you must never ever add water to quicklime. You must always add quicklime to water. The polar opposite rule. I'd rather trust 2,000 years of uh, understanding than five when they said that, started saying that. And you will find this a lot. The rules of the Lyme Revival are actually, in many ways, opposite to the historic rule. That's quite shocking to me. Uh, I was having this conversation. Why on earth, I've said this before, but why on earth did people not do a literature review in the context of all of this because I am the first person who's done it as far as I'm aware on the scale that it needed to be done 
And I'm not saying that to blow my own trumpet. I'm saying that because I'm absolutely gobsmacked that I did that. In 1994, it was published in the Building Lines Forum Journal. Georgia, uh, I, she'll have to forgive me, I'm not going to try and pronounce her name, but she's Greek. She wrote a, a document, as I say, in 93, 94, saying, right, we're using Lime again. What do we need to do to move forward with this? And she, her discussion of the forms of Lime, like this, is very good. Good understanding. Number one, we need to do a comprehensive review of historic literature. 1993. 1998, that paper that she wrote, was adopted by the European Union commissioners as the document about what we need to do. I can tell you that everything she said needed to be done was completely ignored. Nobody ever did it, and that was a, quite a shock to me, really. Anyway, so when they're talking for most of history, they talk about slaking the lime by giving it water, a quick lime, and this is how they made lime putty as well. Don't you know, you would add just sufficient water to the lump lime so that it slakes properly. Then you would dilute it sufficient that you could pass it through a screen. And when you get these multiple lime tanks, there's a grill in between there to remove unslaked lime. Goes into the bottom chamber. The sand might then be mixed with it. That's a hot mix. Or it might be left to mature. But in that case, usually, for use as I've talked about because the point the only reason to lay lime down for any period of time it being made from quick lime is to get rid of residual lime lumps because the purposes you're putting to it demand that there are no lumps in the mortar you can imagine a fine finish coat one millimeter thick or two millimeters thick the last thing you want in that is a bit of grit <laughs> So that's why they laid lime down. Um, the period of laying down typically was a week. Even in the 20th century when we did have lime pits and we were running lime to putty as a binder from the earlier 20th century onwards and we were adding lime for the first time in history to water rather than the other way around, the typical duration in the lime pit was two weeks. Three months is a, I mean, I've seen it once in an old text, Alberti in Italy in 1460, says it might need to be laid down for three months to be of the best quality. But again, we confuse that. What he meant by best quality is it didn't have any lumps in it. That's what he meant. In fact, what they believe, and there is modern scientific uh, investigation that confirms this, that the longer you lay lime down for, either as a lime putty, or as a premixed core stuff, the weaker the lime became in its binding properties. So this idea that we've got, you know, lime suppliers around this country, you've got one of them told me he's got 200 tons of lime putty in storage, maturing. They would say you're an idiot historically because they say you're not maturing it, you're weakening it. You make it's getting weaker and weaker as you lay it down now. That needs to be fully investigated properly to prove one way or the other. Because as I say, I don't believe lime putty to be a bad material. But if we use lime putty, we have to mix it up one lime putty to two. And take allowance for the fact that some of it is water in that volume. So probably more like one to one and a half. And then it will do most of the things that this will do. But it won't be as good a material in even so, is what I would say. But it's certainly not a damaging material, it certainly has its uses. But again, we don't make it the right way. And we don't use, you know, we store it and we'll make some, because I want to demonstrate that to you very clearly. Anyone who uses lime putty knows it's, it's running with water, it's like a slurry. You can't model it in your hand, it would just squeeze out through your fingers. Whereas the stuff, if you make it properly, and I, when I say properly, I mean even by the the guidance of the 1951 British standard for making lime putty. So again, not hundreds of years ago, you get a material that you can mould in your hand that doesn't, that has no free water, just like we saw with the earth. It doesn't even stain your hand, actually. And 
if you were to ask to say, if I asked you what does that remind you of, you would say window putty. Hence, I can see no other explanation as to why it's called lime putty. It's because of its resemblance to window, linseed or window putty is what it resembles. You then would dilute it as you needed to, to use it in different ways. When we used to get lime putty, the reason for maturing it is because that water rises to the top just by sitting there, you pour it off, rises to the top again, you pour it off, and ultimately you end up with a material as dense, if you lay it down for long enough, as dense as what you could have had the day you made it if you just slaked it right. So I want to swear, sorry, I got to... <laughs> it just does my head in, do, do you know what I mean? 1951 British Standard, it's not that long ago. Why didn't people look at that, for God's sake? Anyway, right, and in that standard they are adding water, they are adding the lump line to water. Now, the other thing I should say, the reason they started using, in my opinion, and it seems to be sort of supported by them, the reason they started using lime putty as a binder in the 20th century was because they knew they were going to gauge it with cement. So they weren't just using it on its own generally, they were putting a bit of cement in, and that in their heads compensated for the inherent weakness of the lime putty. Yeah? So that's the context of that. It's not, oh, with, uh, but of course, that's what we remembered. That was well within living memory. We can forgive ourselves in the lime revival for thinking that's how it was done because we could see that people are still doing that, and so on. But, um, so anyway, the British standard for making lime putty says you've got to give them volume of water, you pour lump lime into that water to half the level of the water, and we can do that, and you'll see it goes crazy. Nothing far more hazardous than what we're doing now. It goes crazy, and you end up with that material. Um, now, you... That's giving you an idea that the slaking water proportion, which is where I'm going with this, is about two volumes of water to one quick line. Uh, and that's what I'm going to use here. As I say, historically they generally say just sufficient water to slake it, like we know what that is. It's <laughs> it's only by the end of the towards the end of the 19th century you get some engineers who put figures on this so that's what I'm talking to you about if you want to end up with a dry hydrate there we've got one we made one earlier you add one volume of water <clears throat> it needs back a third all it actually needs to slake it needs back a third in weight of water because that's gen generally what it's lost in in the kiln. That's what it wants back. So translated into volume, one weight is about one volume of water to one volume of quicklime. So if we were to add just one volume of water into here and bank it over, what the lime in there would slate to a dry hydrate like that. So all I did there, you might not have been watching, but I held that under water. One of the Spanish engineers says until it stops whistling which means until it's soaked in all the water it can, so it's got all the water it needs, put it out and you end up with a dry powder. Uh, and that was a common enough slaking method. And dry slaking with sand was a common enough method. Um, so when they were dry slaking, they, they, there's two ways of making a hydrate on site. They would get a basket, you know, an open weave basket, put the lump lime in it, hold it under water for a couple of minutes till it had stopped soaking in the water, tip it out and it would slake to a dry hydrate. And they could then sieve that hydrate. So in building accounts you see it regularly, lime sieves, lime sieves. Uh, so they could sieve out the lumps. It doesn't, you don't need to sieve out lumps if you're building a rubble stone wall, but if you're building a brick wall with joints like that, you want rid of the bigger lumps. So they could sieve that out and then mix it through. And they, as often as not, that would be done when that was still hot. And you get a different material. If you, if we gave that water as soon as, you know, slaked it to hydrate, sieved it, still very hot, 
mix sand with it, mix it through to a mortar. That will be a different, the mortar will have a different character to if we did all that, left that alone for a couple of weeks and then mixed it. The first option would be more workable than that. It's still a good mortar, but it would be different in character. So where I'm going with this is the hot mixing method delivers a mortar that you can't get any other way that has those properties the other forms of lime don't give you that lime putty yes but you will always have free and available water in a lime putty mix free and available water is actually a problem if you're building it means that when you put a brick especially if you soak that brick in water which they didn't do historically uh, you put that on there that film of water is what causes swimming bricks. Anyone who's built walls with NHL or with lime putty will understand that you can go so far and then your bricks start to slide around and you've got to stop and step away. Um, I'm tempted, but no. <laughs> Hot mixes stiffen very easily, very readily. So I'm going to say this at least. Sorry, I'm referring to a conversation I had at a great time. If you were building a flint wall, for instance, or a, a wall with cobbles, I've seen the specs for doing that with lime putty mowers. You build two courses, and then you leave it for a couple of weeks. <laughs> and you go back and you build another couple of courses. Because if you try and go any further with an impermeable stone, they'll start to swim around and you lose control. And they lo they're losing place, and so on. It's not that different with NHLs, but in the in the the old paradigm i would call it the idea was the only way you could build a flint wall was to use a, a fast setting hydraulic material that sets fast enough that you can keep building but even then they actually start to swim around within a couple of courses if you were to use a hot mix you could build the whole wall in a day i can tell you that with absolute certainty when we did the hot mix event at canterbury we're just messing around but Rory Young he built a, spa, a spire of flint like that high in five minutes just and it's all there and it's not swimming it's not moving it's stiffening because that's what hot mixes do particularly if you get them in hot there's no mechanical benefit I, I don't think although I'd be open to persuasion if some scientist bothers to look at it that there's a mechanical difference in behavior and performance between a hot use more in a cold as long as it's hot mixed in the first place this is where the magic happens i'm going to get there eventually um and that especially if you use it hot you get early stiffening you can see because the wall the surface water that you have to put in to make it usable is being got rid of by evaporation but it's also being got rid of by suction and so on we've come to, we, because we've been using water mortars that have no water retentivity we've got into the idea that you have to saturate the wall although you can't you think you are but you can't you have to saturate the wall or the joints you soak it for ages you you know I, when i used nhl i didn't believe you could get enough water into that wall you know i'd be spraying it the night before for an hour or two i'd be spraying it as soon as i came in the next morning i'd be spraying it down below me when i'm pointing here and you know None of that is actually good. The more water there is in that fabric, the less bond you're gonna get. You know this, if you wet your wall when you're plastering and uh, and when it's still a bit glistening, you put your stroke your plaster on, it'll just slide down the wall. Because actually, we've come to believe that suction is our enemy. The suction from the fabric of porous material because we've been using mortars that have no inherent water retentivity to resist that suction. And so we wet everything. In truth, and this is what we'll do on that, it is enough to do what builders, you know, the other thing about the line board, we've spent the last four years saying that builders are idiots. In fact, what builders do most of the time, apart from using the cement, is in the is in that 2000 year tradition and this i've come to realize this i feel really bad because i was as bad at condemning builders as everyone and this sounds an extreme thing to say i think the future of lime proper lime will be delivered by ordinary builders 
not by the conservation industry. The conservation industry is still promoting NHL, a lot of them. SPAB apparently did a thing last the other week. They've got a guy talking about the wonders of NHL to build a flint wall. Well, I'm sorry, I'm a SPAB member. I have been for 30 or odd years. This organisation has lost its way in lots of ways, and that's a good example of it. So, anyway, I won't say any more than that. Sorry, oh shit, I said that on camera as well. <laughs> you can edit that. I don't mind. They know what I think. Um, so, we've got to start learning from builders who just splash a bit of mortar in the joint before they point, because that's all is actually necessary. When we lay bricks, we don't need to be, like I used to do with NHL, soaking them in buckets of water for three hours before you use them to, to mitigate that tendency to dry too fast. We just need to use a mortar that has inherent water retentivity. And the most you will do, and there is a great benefit in that, and you'll see that in the old text, particularly in the summer, when you're laying bricks, dip the brick in water and bed it. That's all you need to do. There are technical reasons for that. It's to do with the way water moves into porous materials. But the important point to make is the suction is our friend. The suction is what forms the bond between the two materials. The dewatering of a water retentive mortar slowly but steadily into a porous substrate is what helps to form the bond between that substrate and the mortar. And if you saturate that, you're not making a bond necessarily. So we don't, we don't need to put as much water in as we have done. Uh, so, yeah, these are all things that you, this material teaches you, because you can see it. But anyway, so back to slaking water proportions. If we want a dry hydrate, one volume of water, bank it over, and we the sand. If we leave it for an hour, the sand would dry. So we've got a dry mix. That, that you mix the two together. That can be thrown through a screen, you know, the upright screens, to remove the big lumps of lime that haven't slaked, but also the big lumps of aggregate that in the past were there. We didn't get it all lovely like this, you know, you had big lumps of aggregate that you didn't want as well. So you get rid of both of them and then you can mix it through to a mortar. The other way of making the ordinary method is to wet slake, I suppose we could call it. So I want this to, to make this through to a mortar in one go far more efficient, less handling, uh, and I want to use it straight away. So I, I, need, I can put more water in in the first instance, but again, that's of a, if you, you need to put in two, two and a half parts of water, and you do it all in one go, as said a lot, always, all that water in one go, bank it over, and you, that will slate to a, well, it got a combination of some powder, but otherwise paste, and they would call it paste, not lime putty, because that's a very specific thing, which we didn't understand, that's a very specific material. Lime paste, and then you mix the two together, and if you, you can do either, and then if you want to use it quickly, you would then add the water you need to bring that to the water content that you want, according to what you're doing with it. So, pointing mortar will be stiffer and less wet than plastering mortar. Although again, we had this ridiculous rule in the line revival that you put, and don't, if you read this, which you probably will, if you're doing around online, then say you have to put plaster on as stiff as possible, as dry, effective as dry as possible, as it to reduce the potential for shrinkage. I put plaster on as wet as possible, and I get less shrinkage than if I try and put it on dry, because you, if you're putting it on dry, you're you're going to force that plaster on. I mean, apart from the fact that you couldn't do that all day, every day, because your shoulder would go. Actually, you want the water in the mortar and less in the wall. Again, the opposite of what we've been doing. Um, and if you put the wall, the plaster on, I don't know a plaster who doesn't put it on as wet as they can get it and still be able to lay it on. Again, the deep watering, because it's water retentive, because of this material, the deep watering into the not terribly wet background helps to form the bond. It grabs it uh, like that. You can almost feel it doing it. Grabs onto that wall. So but there are lots of things we need to shift in our practice to get the best out of this material. 
and lots of things we do which are not actually good things to do in building terms. But we've had to do them and we think they're the right thing to do because we've been using the wrong bloody materials that don't have water retentivity. And I would say if you feel, okay, well I want to use NHL, I want to use this, I'm going to really, sat I, uh, but I have to saturate the wall and the building materials to do that. I would say rather, no, what you should be thinking is, I need to use a mortar that has water retentivity sufficient, that you don't need to do all that. You give it a bit of water, just on the technical front, when a porous material gets wet for the first time, there's an initial rate of suction which is fierce. Uh, and then it, and this is not David Wiggins, this is from Hall and Hoff uh, about the moisture movement in porous materials. I'd recommend you read it, but it's mainly equations, so I regret even trying to read it myself. But here and there, there's plain English and it makes sense. So what you're doing when you dip a brick like that, or when you splash a bit of water into the joint just before pointing, you are controlling that initial surge of suction. That's all you're doing, because that's all you need to do. They make the point to resist suction as a whole in a wall. It's not enough to sand and spray the wall for an hour or two hours, because the wall won't, it won't saturate the whole wall. And so long as the whole, because this is a porous composite material that is all porous, as long as there's any dry material in there, the suction will be the same. You can, might wet the whole of that bit there, but it's still going to have that suction because it's still dry. Same applies if you soak a brick. I, you know, you, do it, you soak a brick for a couple of hours, break it in half, and actually the water's only gone that far. The middle of the brick is bone dry. So you can't defeat that suction. You can control it, but not by sat trying to saturate the wall, which is a fool's errand, but by giving it just enough water to, to satisfy that initial rate of suction, after which you've got an equilibrium of suction. Because water in a porous material will seek to find equilibrium throughout that porous material unless it's wicked away before then by the weather which is what happens when you've got a very capillary active water does that make sense to people so right what i'm doing here is a double is a so this is portland limestone that i burned in my own little kiln so that's been burned at something like a traditional temperature 900 degrees this is shaft quick lime, which they burn at about 1100 or 1300 degrees, so a higher temperature. That makes it far more reactive and aggressive in its reaction. And that, I would say, is why, because this higher firing, which is scientifically accurate, it's not, you know, every lime, Boynton talks about this, though I mentioned earlier, every quick lime has a, an optimal temperature burn which worked out scientifically and that can vary and be higher than the traditional uh, and that's what they're doing they're burning at that targeted temperature so it's, you'll see some people saying because they burn it higher it's rubbish that's not true it's scientifically informed burning rather than craft burning is what it is but it does make it hyper reactive and I and the, that I would say is the reason that in the earlier 20th century they did start putting the quick lime into water because of that reactivity, which you'll see in a second. When, you, when I dip that in, nothing happened. If that was a modern lump lime that I dipped in, in there, I wouldn't have been able to hold it. I'd have had to let it go because it would have got so hot so quickly and it would have started firing bullets at me. First time I, I tell you this, this is great. First time I did that dipping with a basket, <laughs> and I did it with cowbucks, the lump lime cowbucks, which is like, fires bullets just for a few seconds because of this higher what it the higher temperature forms a, a hard sort of case harder case around and, and so as soon as it gets the water it, it's expanding and it blows that casing off that's what's happening I think you know, in my simple way so that's why they start putting in water but I, yeah I did it and I, I put it in <laughs> held it in the water and then it's like a <laughs> And I, I was like this and that. I just had to drop it and run away because it was just crazy. So these are some of the adventures we have with quicklime, but they're not they're not normal practice. Again, it's ignorance that leads to these mistakes. Whereas if I'd done it with this, I could have just sat there and I could have looked at it like that. No issue, no spitting, no bullets coming out. So that's the difference between 
traditionally fired, and uh, and there is one one of the commercial line burners, Loist, L H O I S T. They sell, they burn their lime at 900 degrees, and it, it's very benign and it's slight. So okay. That was going to be the question. Right? So I was thinking the average builder or us are going to have to use commercially burnt lime unless, yes. we, unless we build our own. Oh no, lime we are, and I do most of the time. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. In long term, I, I hope that we will re-establish small-scale lime burning in every region because there's no question it's a, it's a more authentic, but it's a nice, it's actually a nicer material um, than this. The, this shrinks more. There's no question that the main consequence of higher firing is more initial shrinkage compared to if you burn it traditionally. That's unquestionably the case. So that would be an incentive to try burning it again at uh, an ordinary temperature, you know, a proper temperature. Okay, so I'm going to give these water. I, I, I think you're far enough away you won't get shot, but you'll see what I mean. So, so into this gibbled line. I mean, with the kibble, it's not so bad, but once the lump gets bigger, it gets like... And I, I can... You know, that's ridiculous, you see, because that... That is pretty much slight. 15 seconds, maybe, 10 seconds. Most of that is already slight. Now, that's... They'd love that, historically, because what you see... Lime... And this is where, you know, it's obvious they're not talking about hydraulic lime. Uh, that you'll see it constantly. The line which slakes the fastest and the hottest is the best. The only line that will do that, slake straight away, is pure lime. So hydraulic lime, quick lime, some of it, depending how hydraulic it is, it, we could have done that that we did with that, we could do this. We'd still be looking at it 12 hours later, waiting for something to happen. That's the difference. I mean, that's it doesn't slake very fast at all. So another reason why, as a craftsman, I mean, that autobine takes about five minutes to get to that. I find that deeply annoying, because the cow bucks I use, like, straight away. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, even five minutes waiting, kicking my eye, I think, God, blimey, that's annoying. Uh, a <laughs> birch does the chalk lime slate slowly as well. I don't use it for demonstrations, because nothing happens for about five minutes. So you lot start getting bored and restless, because nothing's actually happening. You might get bored and restless because I just keep talking, but I mean, right, so that was two volumes of water. And now we'll give the same to the Portland. Right now, if this was the lump form of that, it would be, it would be fired with bullets that might reach you. Can you buy that? This? Com no, commercially, lump forms of... Yes, of I mean, Shap do a 40 mil lump. They do, yeah. Which is good. I mean... It's, and that's the biggest we can get, unfortunately, yeah. in the modern industry, 40 mil. I mean, you know, typically it was maybe the size of your fist. Yeah. Uh, or this. And that's the whole point of this method, is that we're... The whole point of this is that you, we need to break this lump line down to a size that we can mix with sand. That's the only point of what we're doing. So you can see with powder, as you'll see in a minute, we don't need to do it. We don't do it this way. There's good reason not to. We do it a different way. But I'm going to bank that over, and you see not lots happening. That one's going straight away. Bear in mind, this is a year old. I mean, I almost exactly, I burned this during the first lockdown. Um, so, it's a year old. If it had been not kept in a plastic tub, I would expect no, it would have slaked already. Just with air. Because the air will slake lime. If it's moist air. Um, so, I'll leave that one alone. You'll see what's happening here. That's expanding, and that therefore delivering cracks in the thing. Now, you've got to believe me, they are obsessive, but they say, right, so as it cracks, close those cracks up to keep the heat and the steam in. The, even in 1703, Moxon says, not just to keep the heat in, to keep the steam in. And we're thinking, what do you mean by that? Why keep steam in? You know? And then we're thinking, well, actually, when you think about it, at least some of the slaking in here is being done by steam, not by water. Although you can only slake with steam when it's ground to a fine, when it's a fine powder. The dry hydrate that we get from 
tarmac or wherever you buy in the builders merchants, dry hydrated builders lime or whatever they call it, they slake that with steam. I've spoken to tarmac. They, that slake, they grind it to a powder and they slake it with steam. One of the research streams that Historic England have uh, commissioned at Northumbria University, Cecilia Pesca is doing the work. She's finding that, yeah, if you slake with steam, you get different outcomes. You get things going on in the mortar that are more beneficial, you would say. That has, that's another research stream that's going to come together into the research. So it's no coincidence that that's how they slake in the modern industry, with steam. There's good reason to do that. But you can't slake lump lime with steam. I, mean, I found a German paper that a kind German architect translated for me, <laughs> where he goes into all this. Yeah, you can't slake lump lime with steam because you can't give it enough water that will soak in. But you can powder, and there is a definite benefit. So, so OK, that's done. This one's not doing much at the moment. We'll leave that alone. It, that's the main consequence of age with, with traditionally burnt lime, that it, it becomes slower. But the other thing you'll see in old texts is, as, as wherever pot they're saying, slake it straight from the kiln, straight from the kiln. It's like a mantra. As soon as you can get that slake when it comes out of the kiln, the better. Uh, so it, 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 its reactivity diminishes over time, even though it's airtight container. Nice. I'll leave that one for now. Sorry, um, backtrack, and you said about lump lime, that unfortunately you can't get it bigger than 40 mil or something. Yeah. Why do you say unfortunately? Why would it... Oh, well, uh, no, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, I'm just because they used it bigger, that's all. I, I, okay. There's not a so major reason for that, no. no. Um, they're burning it at that size, you see. Yeah. Uh, and they use, they don't use solid fuel, typically, it's gas and so on. So, yeah, you know, I mean, they're, they're, I'm not sure if there was that's one of the reasons they don't want bigger lime lumps. Limestone lumps. Okay, so this one, you can see the sand is drying from that heat coming out. But, and if it was a dry slate, although I put two in, we'd leave that alone. But I'm now going to start mixing the, the two together because, in my opinion, the sooner you can mix the lime and the, the, the sand together, the better, the better the outcome is. But as I say, you need to break it down to a scale that you can mix with, with the lime. And these things, the, all these things are different. I mean, some years ago, Pat McAfee and I did a workshop in Valencia, and these old lime burners turned up. And uh, they were great. Great big portly men, you know, and they stood there like this. They, they weren't working anymore, but they had, their kiln had still been working 10 years before. But anyway, there's several things. But I was just about to do a hot mix with the lime, the lump lime, which is about that big, from Hareth, around there. And I had it all laid out just like this. And one of them, he just said quietly, this is a long story, but I'll cut it short. He just said quietly to me, he stood next to me, he said, oh, I, I wouldn't do it that way. That's all he said. he said. And I said, what would you do then? He said, I'd slake the lime on its own first. So you'd think to make lime putty. And then I said, but would you then mix the sand in straight away as soon as it's like, oh yeah, of course I would. So that's another form of homies. If you do that, it kind of, what it does, it means typically you get more of the lime slaked in the first place when you slake it like through to like a, a putty, a thick putty, but anyway. But anyway, I carried on and did the hot mix. So we did what we're doing now and we mixed the sand in as soon as we possibly could. And again, he just said quietly to me, oh, I see. He said, you get stronger more if you do it that way. And that was that, end of conversation. So, you know, these things all matter. The, 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 there's, the, you're creating slightly different material depending how you do it. But I want to stress the, the two things that, you, that they cancel that you shouldn't do is one, that you don't burn the lime, and the other, that you don't drown the lime. And what that, so that means, like, that place that I mentioned earlier, but not on camera, that just put in a tiny bit of water, um, they burn, that line would have burned. If it reaches 400 degrees centigrade, it burns. Actually, that's not a major issue, uh, except that you haven't put enough water in at that point, so you've got to put more water in. And if the lime is incredibly hot, 
you add the water and it chills that lime. It's just too much of it. You're adding cold water to it, chills it. Nothing more will happen. It will stay where it is. And not, you'll get loads of little bits of grit, lumps of lime that haven't slaked and will never slake. But I would emphasize those are not the lumps that we see in old boilers. That's a different thing. So that's the problem. If you were to actually add boiling water in that scenario, no issue because the boiling water wouldn't chill the lime. But similarly, if you put too much water, and so like if you make lime putty by throwing lump lime into like huge volumes of water, it'll run to a paint, it'll run to a liquid, it'll slake, but you've drowned that. It's, it won't reach a temperature that it needs to reach. And I, that's what I need to talk about. We need this slake, the slaking lime, and you can see the pollen's really going now, and, and you would actually argue possibly expanding more than that did, different expansion rates. And, I, and my experience with the loist is that that expands more than the cow bucks, and that's a function of it being burnt at a traditional temperature. So you're sacrificing some lime content, effectively, by burning at a higher temperature. But, so, and that's getting pretty hot, and that will be about 100 degrees centigrade. I don't need a thermometer to tell me that, because these volumes of water that I'm talking to you about, one volume to the quick line to make a, a dry slake, two volumes or maybe two and a half volumes to make a wet slake, those, those volumes are craft volumes that were worked out to deliver 100 degrees centigrade in this slate, which is what we need. That figure I've got from the modern building industry, as I say, historically they say as hot as possible and that sort of thing. But um, what it needs to achieve to maximize the surface area and the porosity of the lime that we produce, we need, which obviously equates to better bond because we've got more surface area and more porosity in the material, is 100 degrees centigrade. It might reach 120, but that's the margins. And when again, when I was talking to Tarmac, Lafarge down in Buxton about this, they're, they're, they're aiming, when they slake their dry hydrate, they're aiming for a temperature of between 100 and 120 degrees. And that is important. If you don't reach that temperature, I think in the modern industry they'll tolerate 80 degrees centigrade, but anything below that, Although you'll get something that looks like lime, it hasn't reached the temperature it needs to reach, its performance will be impaired. It won't be what it could be. That's all that we need to say. I would suggest that a lot of lime putty that's been made over the last four years has been made by drowning it. And that might be another reason why it is. And, and, and a lot of the engineers said that if you slake like that, some even called it slaking by drowning this method because they, they and that's another reason for the suspicion they they couldn't believe that a craftsperson wouldn't just put far more water to make it easier to do it than less so that, that's another reason for suspicion about lime putty but um, anyway so with this one and that one's really catching up and look at the expansion in that that's brilliant but well, I think it is anyway I'm sad uh, I love this Portland stuff I, could, uh, I really would the one source material that we don't burn in this country anymore is oolitic limestone. And all of the whole stone belt of England, you know, up from Portland right up to Yorkshire. That was much burned in the past. And I, when I've made mortars with, we'll see if you can tell the difference. That is the most, that. A hot mix made with oolitic limestone is the best I've ever used. And I can't tell you why, as the modern ASTMS standard is in America is, workability is something you can't define. Only the craftsman can know what that is, really. You can't, re you can't judge it in a lab. There's no lab test that can say what workability is. It's only you or, you or me that can really say what it is. That sounds ridiculous, and I don't want to go down this mythology route about craftsmanship, but you know what I mean, that, that there is some point to that. You, but once you've made a few, you see, you know what it should feel like. And that's the important thing. You know if it's... The other thing about those volumes of water, because obviously ambient temperature has, a, has an effect, is that 
with those volumes of water you will reach that 100 degrees centigrade whether it's minus 5 today or it's 20 degrees today. You can, you can circumvent all of that by using boiling water to slake. You can imagine it only needs to rise a few degrees to reach the right temperature. And they did use boiling water where they could to slake hydraulic lime because it slaked faster. They didn't have to wait 12 hours or whatever it might be, you know. So boiling water, and, it, and there's only one person that I know of who looked at this, slaking water and temperature, 1960, a guy called Miller, um, I had to go to the British Library to find the text, but, uh, and he tested with different temperatures of water, slaking with different temperatures of water and so on, and different volumes of water. If you slaked with boiling water, drowning is never an issue, you could flood it with water, but in normal circumstances, these water slaking proportions are all you need to know, but you shouldn't depart from them, is what I'm saying to you. You know, as somebody discovers it might explode <laughs> uh, if you've got far too little and the air can't get out. In other cases, it's just not reaching enough temperature. So, yeah, so that one now is good to go, good to be mixed. You can see it's not all paste. In fact, there's a lot of powder. And of course, the, the actual precise volumes that you would use vary according to the line. So you, you need to test that before you do it, they'll say. It might be three, three volumes of water. And I'm thinking, this is only the second time I've done this with the tournament. I'm thinking probably three more volumes of water would have been better because I've got a lot of powder. It doesn't matter, except you might breathe it in. That's, you know, I don't worry about a bit of powder myself. So, right, okay, we'll leave that one for a minute or... If you had the option. I do for making lime wash, yeah. Yeah. Or hot water for lime wash. Um, our experience has been if you use hot water to make lime wash, you need less lime to get the same thickness. And others are saying you need less pigment to get the same colour if you slake with boiling water. There are reasons for that. I try, I'm trying to avoid getting too technical, but if you slake with boiling water, you get a finer particle size than otherwise and therefore more surface area and more porosity. So, yeah, there is virtue in slaking with boiling water if, you, if you've got access to it, or with hot water. But it's not essential if you, if you use these volumes of water, that's the point. So now, I've got that, I mean, we haven't got far off a dry slate there. That could be set aside just as it is, as a core stuff if we wanted to, and mixed up later, but I'm going to go straight in with, uh, with more water. And this is the point, whether you're making lime wash, lime putty, or this, you slake with given volumes of water, you, you can then, once the slake is complete, and that's the critical thing, which it substantially is, then you can add whatever water you need according to the purpose you're putting it to. But only after it's slaked, not, don't put all that water that you know you need. One of the questions I get from some lime suppliers is, how much, what's the proportion for making lime wash? What's, what are the water proportions you use? And I'm thinking to make a, a plastering water. I think, well, I can't tell you that. I don't even think about it in those terms. But you can see that they might be then tempted, not them, but anyone might be tempted. If you know you're going to put four volumes of water in the end, to put it all in the first place. But that's exactly what you shouldn't do. Because it stops the lime from slaking at the right temperature. The, of all the rules, these the, the, there are two fundamental rules which are universal all over the world. That is slaking method and water proportion. Those are the two things which are constant everywhere in the world. All the diversity comes from other places, aggregates, you know, regional diversity and so on. But don't let anyone tell you that, oh, yeah, but it might be different in India or it might be different in Thailand. It, no, these rules are made by the material in truth you know, and, and we need to adhere to them and we ignore them at our peril. Several at least of the line suppliers who are suddenly now, suddenly, having done some of them, not all, having done their best to discredit us five years ago and since, which they did. Um, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm going to tell you on camera. 
Two years ago, I was asked by the chairman of the Building Line Forum to leave the Building Line Forum. <laughs> he said he was sure that I had better things to do with my time. Um, and beyond that, that I'd done a great job, but now it was time to leave it to the professionals. Uh, I didn't leave. Um, but anyway, that tells you something, I, I think, I hope you can see, I'm not just being certain scores there, that tells you something, if the, the main organisation committed to the user line wants me to leave, I hope you think I, I have some idea what I'm talking about, <laughs> that says a lot, doesn't it? But, um, but beyond that, the idea that this sort of knowledge is not the domain of craftspeople. Leave it to the architects. We've seen why I am going to do that for a hundred years. And I'm not down on architects, don't get me wrong. <coughs> As many architects I'd say that to, so we'd be bloody delighted if you did, if you, you take back the role. Because it drives us mad trying to specify more. You know. Anyway, okay. So now you're just feeding the extra water in and knocking it together and ridiculously I've only just started using those power wisps that you get, you know, like, I, I'm just thinking, why have I never used them before? <laughs> I mean I use a barren mi a pan mixer for volume work, but actually for most pointing work this is exactly how I mix, for several reasons. But, and I don't, I really don't find that inefficient because I can, it gives me the option of using this hot. So small batches use hot. Um, so are, you, are you adding water to get it to a consistency as opposed to like volumes of, you know? No, but you can, I mean, there are some, because the one thing that is, again, constantly said uh, is that you beat the mortar. The, the mortar once made needs to be beaten. I think that's more, that's absolutely more in my opinion, my experience, that's more necessary if you if you make a dry slate and mix that in these pounding. But don't think this is just a little bit. When they put figures on it, they will, you know, a typical cubic meter of mortar, they will say that needs to be beaten and pounded for eight hours by two men. I mean, that's a lot. The reason for it, that as far as we can work out, and they'll always say a well-beaten mortar will be a stronger mortar. That's always said. Um, and you pound it to workability. It, it, it's, whereas we, again, in the modern industry, we use waters to increase workability. They're specifically not wanting to put more water in because, of course, that translates into more initial shrinkage. And you can bring it to that workability when it's got less water in by pounding it. There's only one piece of research that's been done on this. Um, I wish I could say I wish I could remember her surname, but she's a Czech material scientist over in Czech Republic. Uh, Dagmar is her first name. I can tell you that. But it's Mac Mackinova, I think. Mac Mackinova. <coughs> She looked at that and it was very interesting because what she saw that was what pounding delivers is that it, it increases the volume. She didn't, this was done 10 years ago, so she didn't, it wasn't linked to what we have been talking about or David. The, the pounding increases the volume of one micron pause. So it's increasing the volume of capillary active pores, which you can see in their minds would equate to stronger because it's more durable because it's getting rid of the water before the frost can get it more efficiently that's how i would interpret that statement we don't do it but this again this at least this method does allow me to whack it around some i, I personally believe it's not as necessary with a if you're taking it straight through like i am and making the mortar straight away you know that's pretty bloody workable i mean do i need it more workable than that i don't know but I could have put less water in. I mean, there is a guy, Paul Gingell, down in uh, 
Cumbria who's really into all this but and really thinking about it. Um, and he actually only just puts in those two volumes of water and then pounds it through to a workable mortar. So, and they, yeah, he'll get less shrinkage for doing that. So, that's just something to consider. It's not, I believe, essential, but it's some, that's one area we really need to home in and understand better. Of course, once they add roller mills, that does that for you. And again, we shouldn't think of roller mills as being a modern, even a Victorian invention. They used to build them in the medieval period, you know, and a trench with rollers and a beam, you're pushing it round. And of course, the roller mill is doing that work for you. And such as I've used mortar out of a roller mill, that's the best mortar in the world. I mean, <laughs> basically, if you make it in a roller mill. But I think the cheapest you can get a roller mill is about three and a half thousand pounds at the moment. Uh, but, uh, and the barren mixers that we use, yeah, they're, they're forced action. They, they give a great mortar as well. It's not, but they, we're talking levels of greatness, not rubbish versus goodness, in fact. And even an NHL mortar made in one of those would be a better mortar than it would be made any other way. But those whisks are great, aren't they? They do really yeah. silk it up. So how you, sorry, so how, if you were making a plaster mix, yeah. would you make a large volume? Would you because right now, this mortar here has still got lumps in, you see? If you use a whisk, they tend to go, you lose all your lumps. So there are some architects, quite recently, who want the lumps there because it's matching the mortar that's got lumps in. So that's the downside of them, that they will engage pretty much all of the lime if it's there to be engaged. Um, and the, the lime lumps, and that's, I, I haven't mentioned that, but you know, if, if you, when you look at an old mortar, and you see little lumps of lime, they could be any size depending on the size of the joints and so on. That's a fairly solid um, reason to say they were hot mixed from quicklime. That's because what we'll get in here, and you've, we've got some here, there is some of this lime which is slightly underburned, there's some that's slightly overburned, uh, and that won't necessarily slake. Uh, as well, so th those will be the lump. They're either underburned lime or owner burned lime, which hasn't slaked uh, because of that. But equally, it can be just lime that was never mixed in, that's then carbonated in situ. That's the most common lime lump you'll see, because they know what they want it to feel like. They know when they've got enough lime. They're not going to uh, you know, obsessively try and mix every bit of lime in, um, necessarily, unless they feel they need to. So, and those are the things, when you hear about late slaking, it's that underburned or overburned lime, which might slake later. But again, I have to say to you that with pure lime, late slaking is a very rare event. <laughs> the late, sl late slaking is a major problem if you use hydraulic lime from quick lime. That's, and that, again, that's infected our understanding. So you'll get people saying, oh, late slaking, you know, and all this. It's very rare. I mean, one of the things at your uni with the practical, we did eight square meters of plastering on lath, on panels. I did half of it with powder quick lime that I'd mixed the night before to a plaster. And you know, there's, there's no chance of lace laking. It's powder for goodness sake, you know. So, uh, and we did the other, we used the shaft 40 mil mixed it there and then on site, put it on stinking hot and uh, a week later when it had all set up, in all those eight meters, square meters, we had two centimeters of late slaking. And this is a base coat of course, so what does that matter? Late slaking is really only a, an issue in your fine finish coat. You know, you've done all this and then suddenly it looks like it's full of bullet holes or someone's coming with an air rifle. <laughs> That's what lake slaking looks like. It lifts the surface off, and there's always a white dot at the bottom of it. <clears throat> so, so yeah, again, we shouldn't confuse. A lot of the things we say that are bad about lime, that's NHL that gives those bad things because of its nature. Um, I used a Declan down at um, Jot Down Lime. He, he, he found this uh, hydraulic quick lime in France, 
that's burned with anthracite in a traditional kiln, we thought, great, and we think it's probably feebly hydraulic. So I had some off him, powder, and then in the first lockdown, I, you know, we're doing stuff in our house, and I had to replace this cement around the fireplace. I thought, okay, I'll give it a go. We don't own the house, actually, so I'll give it a go. Uh, and it was fine. It slaked within about 10 minutes, I suppose. It was powder. Um, and, yeah, went on. Shrinkage cracks, day one. Okay, close them down. Shrinkage cracks, day three, day four, day five, day six. And four months, and so in the end, I was going around, I think, oh, fuck's sake. I, th I wish I'd used pure lime, and, uh, <laughs> and and then still, it's still lake slaking a year. I got, I can see under the little bits of lifting off this material. A year later, and I thought, oh, for goodness sake, that's the problem. And that's another reason why you wouldn't use natural hydraulic lime for these purposes. Yeah. Okay. So right, let's go with this one. You can see we've actually got, I would say, more volume of lime there. The, the traditionally burned stuff. Can I just uh, clarify yeah. something? On the, um, you said about plaster work and how you use it as wet as possible and it doesn't shrink. Uh, no, I didn't. No, I didn't mean that. It does shrink. Okay. okay. But less. But less. So the key thing is, but using using it hot means it shrinks less. Well, I mean, I go. Yeah, from the recent yeah. stuff we've been doing with hot plaster, it doesn't shrink at all. Okay. Um, so, because because I. I may have misunderstood, but you're saying, you know, don't add too much water to the water, otherwise you'll get more shrinkage. But with the plaster... Uh, yeah, no, yeah, no, I, I, I can hear where you're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's just, that's what we find. I can't... Yeah. No, no, it's okay. I just have yeah. to know if I'm, if I'm misunderstood. <laughs> if you've got a porous background, easy. yeah, I mean, yeah. You're, the, the dewatering, but that, again, I'd say, is specific to lime-rich hot mix mortars, and yeah. I'm not saying use other ones soaking wet. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's and you fine. couldn't anyway. The, yeah. the thing is with this stuff, you can, plaster made with this, it's just far stickier and doesn't slump, and you can actually have it, you can apply it almost at the wick, liquid limit, although you're only supposed to use that term for mud, I'm told. Um, but you know what I mean by the liquid limit, and, uh, and, and it still won't slump. But I mean, recently, or a year or so ago, I did a experiment with, um, well, no, sorry, I didn't do it. I was doing a job at a church where they'd rendered the whole bloody inside with cement years ago, but there was a Hopton Wood limestone monument. And of course, the salts were coming out through that and degrading it. So I, I just said, well, let's just put a nine inch margin of airline plaster around the monument, at least, to protect it. And I had a bit of that watery lime putty kicking around in the back of the van uh, and which I bought to show so I, I thought right I'll, I'll use that I'll mix it at once too and I'll use that and I, I wet up the background a little bit I stroked it on and it just peeled straight off again and I thought oh, yeah I remember that <laughs> lime putty but you stroke on a bit of hot mix and it's never coming off again believe me that's the difference uh, as I say, it grabs, it somehow grabs the background and hangs on. And the same with hot lime washes and so on. It's the heat that's doing it somehow. I mean, I did a, when we did Holy Trinity in York, I made that a bit wet, but that's about building wetness. So, um, for all that I just said, that obviously didn't need much more water, did it? So it's expanded, but the wall was in there, which is, you can't see it. Um, but yeah, with with hair or with um, hemp shiv in there, that's about as wet as I would have the plaster, actually. So you're stroking it on. You're not. So um, yeah, so that's that one with the Portland. I mean, I'm going to let that stiffen down some because I. It doesn't currently look like right, the best yeah. war in the world that I said it was with the Ulysses Lime Stone. But, uh, right, okay, well, how are we doing? Where's the app on? She was tapping her watch a minute ago. If, if you made it too wet, what do you do about it? Oh, well, in, in normal business work, if it is too wet, I just put in a little bit of quick lime. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, none of these things are really that critical in, in what we're talking about vernacular architecture. 
So yeah, you put in a little bit of quick lime. Not a lot, it, you'd be amazed. If I just put in a, about that much on the end there. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that was, the pro again, the problem with lime putty mixed at, well, even at one to three, you would always end up with a slurry. Yeah. The water's in there, you can't, and you should certainly never add water to a lime putty. Uh, and so you, then you get, you know, I've got the guide saying, so right, okay, you make your lime putty mortar, Oh blimey, it's too wet. Right, okay, so you get a wooden board like this and you put it down on the wooden board for about four hours so the water's extracted from it until you can use you, you remember this. You know, it's true, isn't it? I'm not lying. I'm not lying about this. And, I, and that's ridiculous. Again, that's telling you something that they didn't do this. Surely they didn't do this. Yeah, I mean, uh, but right. So I'm, I need, before lunch anyway, which I just don't like the, you know, I don't know what. Has anyone got the time? Got a past one. That's why then, because we're supposed to have lunch with one, aren't we? I'd better just do a, a quick one with powder, just so you, it's at the same moment and you don't get confused. So I'm not going to, I'm going to use this powder for that, but, um, so I'm going to do the same mix, and then we'll have lunch. Yeah, is that all right? You're not gagging for lunch, are you? I'm just gagging for a week, but I'm, that'll, yeah. <laughs> that'll do me at lunchtime. But, um, so, and I, because I, I really want to, yeah, you need to see this in tandem, really. So with powder, and this again, don't get the idea that they didn't use powder historically, they did. First description, detailed description I've got is 1771. Uh, and actually, wonderfully, he says that you do it in a small container with a trowel and do exactly the method that we evolved with knowing nothing 15 years ago. So I was delighted when I found that. Um, but, so, so it's powder. We don't need to break those lumps down such that we can mix them with the sand. We can mix them with the sand straight away. And if we were to put it in the middle and give it water, there is that hazard that it would pop because you get build up of steam in deeper in the powder and poof. So you wouldn't want to do it that way. That's what I'm saying to you. Again, we're still on the health and safety front. You would not mix lime putty by the lime powder by the ordinary method. This is the method. So you mix it all together from the get go. That's already slaking, that's already hot, because it's just picking up the moisture in the sand. Um, and if I was to leave that, that could get hot, uh, because there's not enough water to slake at all, but it's enough to get the slake going. This can very easily reach 200, 300 degrees centigrade if you left it alone. We used to do that, we thought that was great. <laughs> not that we knew it was that hot, but you, you know. And I, but I'm not gonna do that, because, I, well, I'm gonna let it go a little way just so you can see what happens. So that's like, you can see the heat coming off, that's not dust, it's heat. And as it starts to do that, the powder, which is already fine, is going to a super fine powder as it takes the water in. It starts to behave like water. You can see as I drag through, it's flowing a bit like water. I mean, that gets more if I left it longer. I mean, that's pyroclastic flow, I'm told, you know, as you get out of the volcano. That's what's happening here. But it's going to an even finer powder. So, again, whenever they talk about using powdered quicklime, which obviously they had to grind up, they'll say that makes the strongest mortar of all, or the stickiest mortar of all. And that, again, would be because of the particle size we're developing in here. It's finer. And if we slake this with hot water, it would be finer again. So... Um, but, I, but given what I know now, because we used to feed it in incrementally. Um, Was it doing that just with the atmospheric moisture? No, it's moisture in the sand. Oh, in the sand, okay, yeah. Which isn't much, but it's enough to, yeah, yeah it'll, it's so desperate for water, it'll get it from wherever it can. Yeah. Um, this, but you can, you can go straight in with two volumes of water if you don't want any dust at all, because there is clearly dust. But again, when they talk about this, they tend, in this case, so with the, the ordinary method, all of the water to slate goes in in one go, 
with this method they talk about doing it a bit more incrementally um, which is what I'm doing here but you could actually put in two volumes of water straight away if you want no dust to arise out of it yeah if you see that as a hazard which of course it is you wouldn't want to breathe this in um, I've done it a number of times in the course of science of course best one was once when it was rising out and I it made me sneeze so I, I, I went <gasps> to sneeze without being able to control it and took it right down here, the dust. Uh, you can believe me or not, but all that actually happens is the, your nose runs for about five minutes, you know, mucus gets developed. I, I don't think it's done any damage and I, who am I to talk about that? I smoke. So, and it, on the bags even, it, it's, it, it's just, breathing it in is classified as an irritant, not as, you know, like, get yourself to hospital straight away sort of thing. It's just an irritant. Um, Once you've opened one of those bags, do you need to use it with, or keep it in a sealed container? I, I turn it down. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll turn it down so it doesn't get any moisture, but you're not wrong. I mean, the air, once that's open, the air can slake it. Yeah. Uh, and if you left it open, but again, because it's powder, It'll only air slate the top because that, that stops the air getting deeper and getting the moist air. So actually you might lose the top inch of it, all this slate. Oh. Um, I think I've overdone the water again, but let's see. But it's not a fire risk. No, don't think so. I mean, I am lazy, just like Henry Scott said we are. When I get a ton of this arrive on site, I, it takes me quite a lot of uh, time to move it indoors, <laughs> and I tend to cover it with plastic. But you know, there is one place where the water can get in; it's here. And I, yeah, I've, I've, I've had once it gets in a bit, and then it melts the bag, and then it goes down and melts the bags, and you, you got to pick one out, and it will just this bag just splits open and it goes everywhere. But so. <laughs> Yeah, keep it out of the way. Um, but otherwise, no. I mean, it, yeah, there is a putative fire risk if the, if you get a little bit of water into a great volume of quick But you, you said you'd overdone it with water, but that looks. No, I'm not sure I have bit. actually now. Yeah. Mm. On reflection, All right. I thought I had, but <laughs> I still have some dry hidden away down there. <laughs> I mean, depending on, this could be a pointing more. It, I, I do find, if you're pointing back to earth, you need the pointing more to be slightly wetter than we otherwise, to make a proper bond to it. But, but that's, that's sort of the determinants of your variable water content, really. Um, so, yeah, so that's powdered quick lime mix. You can see it's really straightforward. As far as, you know, one of the things that was said a lot as well, Oh yeah, but you know, you can't do this on a modern building site. It is, um, but what's the, if we're using a mixer, what's the difference between mixing that and making a mortar than putting NHL or cement in? What's the difference in time, in everything else? There is a difference in time, which is the best practice with NHL says you should leave that mortar mixing in the mixer for at least 20 minutes. This one, as soon as it's made, you have it out. As soon as that's all together, so it's five minutes to make a mix. So actually, the time is on the side of this. So, but that to me is why powder is the thing for most work, because it is so straightforward. You know, it doesn't. This is something that any any build or anyone can use, um, and use it in the same way they use the other materials. They just have to get used to the fact it's going to get hot, and they need to keep your eye on it when you're mixing it, because if if it, you haven't got enough water in when it's slaking, the mixer will seize and it will be like concrete in there and you literally have to dig it out. You, you never get that mixer going again until you've dug it all out. So you've got to keep your eye on the water contents uh, but uh, as you're feeding it in. But that's, you know, in a mixer I do exactly the same. I get the, all the aggregates in, this is in a pan mixer, then the lime and straight away I'll pour a bucket, of, a full bucket, the bucket being the gauge of everything else, a full bucket of water in, 
that takes the lime down through everything. I don't have to wait for the lime to mix with the sand. And then I'll feed in a second bucket, slightly more in slowly. And then I just keep my eye on it so that when I can see, because it stiffens and stiffens, and then you need to add a bit more water. And that's how I do it. So that's dead straightforward. But you're still working to the same typical volumes of water, two for each quick line. So, yeah, and this will continue to stiffen a bit. But, um, but it's a lot, yeah, again, it's a lovely water. And it, it, the one thing I would say, I've mixed this at one to three. I've been banging on to you about one to three. But you've also got to remember that that one to three proportion was worked out for lump lime in the knowledge that some of the lime you slate will be lump and not binder. And whenever they <coughs> specify slate lime, which they do, the maximum amount of sand that goes to that slate lime is two. So one to two is what you'll see. And I would say that's that one to three with lump lime is designed to deliver a mortar that is one to two in binder typically. Clearly we're using powder which is 100% binder. So although I generally myself still mix it one to three because I'm as conservative as everyone else, this is what we've had all our success with over the last 15 years. Mainly success. <laughs> um, I'm reluctant to change but in, you could very reasonably mix it one to four with powder because you're going to get one to two. In my kitchen sink experiments, this quick lime expands 2.2 times on slaking. So actually, yeah, if you mix it one to four, you'll get less initial shrinkage. It will still be as good as it needs to be in terms of binder proportion and so on. And there is a saving there. But having said that, this bag cost me 10 quid. Uh, that's the cost of, and that's because it's in a bag. If you buy a quick line by the ton, which if you do, you need to get it into buckets. You can't just leave it in the bag. Believe me, it's about that. <laughs> so there's a double handling there. It's, it's 200 pounds a ton. This is 400 pounds a ton, but you're paying for the packaging. But in a commercial world, that packaging is priceless. Because it's, you, this will still be good in two years time as long as I don't open the bag that's a big bonus so okay so just bear those things in mind so one to four is a perfectly reasonable proportion to mix powdered lime at but you would never mix lump lime at, at less than one to three mm -hmm.